Good morning. Can I welcome everyone to the eighth meeting of the Justice Committee in 2016 and can ask everyone to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices as the interview with broadcasting, even when they're put in silent. No apologies have been received. Turn to item one, Police Scotland. It's the first item today and it's an evidence session of Police Scotland's <coughs> internal communications and on its policies and procedures in relation to the protection of staff who report wrongdoing of malpractice within the organisation. That's the topic. That's the, that's the subject for today. The session is intended to build on the committee's recent evidence gathering on the interception of communications while moving the debate on to related matters of public interest concerning the work of Police Scotland. And can I welcome the meeting for the very first time and possibly the last time in this session. Uh, no, you're coming for the subcommittee on policing. So it's a penultimate appearance of Chief Constable uh, Philip Gormley uh, and of uh, Andrew Flanagan, <coughs> Chair of the SPA. You've been here before. And John Foley, the SPA's Chief Executive. Uh, you're, you've been under long-term service with us, I think, seeing you many times. Uh, when questions are asked um, uh, by a member directly to you, your microphone will come on automatically. Otherwise, if you indicate to me you wish to respond, I'll call you and um, you know, your light will come on. So you don't need to bother pressing anything. Right, straight to questions, please. I've got Christian followed by Margaret. Thank you very much, Covina. Then, uh, good then morning. Go. Good morning to the panel and good morning. Uh, I just wanted to have some clarification. I cannot understand why, for the life of me, we haven't got a whistle blowing policy, but instead we have decided to write it uh, differently than other organisations who really specify by whistle blowing should be. Policy should be about whistleblowing and not being about um, disclosure, for example. I'm happy to do that. I mean, um, thank you. We, we've got a range of um, what are called standard operating procedures, and in preparation for this, clearly I've had a look at them. I, I can list them. They all deal with um, support to staff in a range of circumstances, including when they're raising issues of concern or conscience. Um, and, and they're all fit for purpose. Um, would you like me to read it, um, convener? I can. It's about um, 12, 12 or so SOPs. You want to hear the list? I would be happy to. You want to okay. hear the list? <laughs> the list is: um, we have a t a policy, standard operating procedures around attendance management, business interests, complaints about the police, a disciplinary standing operating procedure, equality, diversity, and dignity, equality <coughs> impact assessment, gifts, gratuities, hospitality, and sponsorship. Um, grievance, uh, grievances, notifiable associations, uh, Police Service of Scotland conduct regulations, stress management, suspension from duty, transgender people in employment, and trauma risk management. So we've got a range of SOPs that touch on or support staff officers who have issues either in terms of their own personal position or issues of cause of concern. What, what I have done in terms of looking at this is, is think through, whilst those in themselves are perfectly respectable and I think fit for purpose in the large part. Do, do they add up in totality to a position where we are developing a culture that enables staff to step forward with confidence? Um, and what I've asked and commissioned is, is a review really that looks at and understands the culture within the service and the key issues and dilemmas faced by staff, um, looks outside of our organisation at best practice, whether that's international, in the business world, law enforcement or, or third sector. What, what I found particularly in the National Crime Agency, and I think there, is, uh, there are clear parallels here, is we are asking staff to operate in an, in an increasingly complex environment. Some of the threats that they are now being asked to deal with take them into slightly different spaces, particularly around privacy uh, and, and issues of conscience and concern. And what I want is, in fairly quick time, to understand whether there's some learning that we can um, in, in, in incorporate into our approach. So. You know, there are other police services. The most obvious ones to look at would probably be the Metropolitan Police in London because there's a similarity of scale and complexity. Police services in Northern Ireland are working in a very complicated environment. Um, and actually, um, post-Snowden, there are issues around, as we ask staff to, to work in difficult and sensitive environments, how do they ventilate their views? How do they make us aware? And the final piece for me is around there must be some learning, for instance, from the health service. You know, if you look at the sort of issues that they have confronted around staff being able to make known their views, their concerns around policy, practice, procedures, then 
uh, I think we can probably look at that because where I want to get to is, is not just a list of what are very sensible standard operating procedures, but does it add up to a, an approach which develops a culture where staff are prepared to come forward and feel supported and confident in doing so? Where does that lead us to? Well, I'll, I'll wait to see what comes back, but I want us to be best in class around developing that culture. Uh, and I don't rule out you know, developing an ethics committee within the organisation, ethics counsellors. You know, there are other approaches elsewhere, where as we move into this more complicated world, I think that it's not simply about distinct SOPs which, which deal with specific issues. They are part of it. It is what is that overarching culture in the organisation? Does it add up to the sort of environment where staff have those abilities, that ability to speak up with confidence and what can we learn from elsewhere? Christian. Uh, one thing we could have learned from elsewhere is first of all to answer the question and second of all maybe to answer the question about whistleblowing. I, I knew all your answer and thanks very much for your comprehensive mm -hmm. answer. I didn't hear the word whistleblowing and, and I kind of I don't understand why an organization who will want to encourage whistleblowing are not using the word whistleblowing in its language. Um, well, I'm very happy to use the word whistleblowing. Um, it, there are some issues around that as a term. Um, you know, some people take exception to that as a description. I think the real issue here, is, for me, is about how do we enable staff who have issues of conscience or concern around law, practice or procedure to raise those, raise those in the organisation. Because as the Chief Constable, I want to understand that. I want to know whether you know, there are unintended consequences of the approaches we are taking around issues. You know, there may be issues around how performance management is impl implemented at a, medium, at a middle or a more junior level of management. If staff feel under uh, pressure or are not clear about what is being expected of them or have issues, we want, I want to hear about it. So um, you know, what I'm saying is... I want to launch, you know, I am commissioning a, a comprehensive piece of work to look outside of the organisation and how do, we under, how do we support staff who want to raise issues of concern, whistleblowing to use the vernacular. But what do we then do with that information? How do we develop our service? You know, how do we develop the sort of internal culture which is about continuous improvement? You know, there are some really good pieces of practice in Police Scotland. We've been recognised by Stonewall as a, you know, in the top, eight, top 100 employees in terms of our responses to... Uh, people with you know, transgender, transsexual, gay issues. There are some really good pieces of work within our organisation. What I want us to be is best in class. And those, all of those SOPs that I've outlined provide elements of support. My, my, my question to the organisation, and therefore myself, is do they add up in totality to the sort of position I think we need to adopt? And I want to look externally around what is the best possible, to use your phrase, whistleblowing policy. But it's not just about the policy. It's about how we then use the information coming back from staff, how we hear their voice, how we reflect on the ethical dilemmas, the legal challenges that they are confronting, to make sure that we provide the best possible service we can to the public. Let me put it to the SPA. You know, it's, it's about encouraging whistleblowing, and, and we heard from the Chief Constable, you know, talking about what's happening afterwards once people ha have, have, have made uh, their, their commitment to be whistleblower. But has the SPA got any views on how the policy should concentrate on encouraging whistleblowing? I think uh, uh, the authority conducted a, an internal audit of uh, whistleblowing policies in the first half of 2015. And I think there were three issues that came out of that that I think uh, need to be uh, further looked at. One is... Um, the policy itself, it's, it, within the police service, it is referred to as integrity matters. To all intents and purposes, the audit found that this is a whistleblowing policy by any other name. And there, there has been some resistance uh, from uh, Police Scotland in terms of using that phrase, uh, whistleblowing, and, and the Chief Constable can uh, comment on that. But to all intents and purposes, if you put whistleblowing at the top and you read it, you would see it was a normal policy that you would see in most walks of life. I think the three issues, <coughs> excuse me, one is it's, it's more nar narrowly drawn into professional standards and uh, criminal acts than you would normally expect in a more general uh, uh, whistleblowing policy. I think the second thing, there were some issues about 
how it's been communicated and rolled out and the usage of of it as a policy and I think it could be better embedded and in fact we saw within the staff survey issues about uh, communication uh, internal communication with staff and I think that could be improved on so as a small example there's many many posters if you walk into any police office you will see the integrity matters uh, uh, posters up on the wall so encouraging uh, people to do it but they don't have the phone number or uh, you know as a simple thing that that uh, that shouldn't happen um, the third area I think where there is a weakness is that it doesn't actually deal with complaints or whistleblowing that might arise as a result of uh, the work of professional standards or the counter corruption unit. It's un unclear, it's not specified as to if you have a complaint against the people who in themselves would conduct the investigations, uh, how do you report that? The only alternative to going through the channels that are, are specified is to go to your staff association or to crime stoppers and I think potentially the SPA should have an identifiable role within that in terms of complaints of that nature or whistleblowing of that nature. So that's the policy but can you tell us uh, the number of whatever we want to call it whistleblower or uh, the number of disclosures uh, that have occurred since the inception of Police Scotland? I don't have that information. Uh, I'm not sure I can answer that specific question in terms of the total numbers since Police Scotland, but what, ca what I can say in response to the points made by the Chairman around integrity matters, which, which um, was introduced uh, in March last year and um, superseded a position called Safe Call, as I understand it, there have been 133 um, referrals into integrity matters from members of staff. Can you explain to me integrity matters, these referrals, what were they about? Well, get the, some examples. Well, I, I don't have precise examples, but the broad sense of them, there were 29 around um, issues around potential criminality and 104 more general ones. And they were all of whistleblowing type? Well, they were all... Or general, uh, com general comments? Well, I, I, I haven't reviewed all 133 of them, as I'm sure you would understand, but actually they are issues that staff have felt that they wanted to bring to the attention of the organisation I say 104 are, are general concerns or, or, or non-criminal concerns and, um, and 29 are criminal. R some of those referrals have led to misconduct proceedings and some have led to reports going to the Crown. So there's a, there's a broad mixture in there of um, serious and not so serious issues. Have you got some, some feedback on how uh, the people who've done that whistleblowing have been protected uh, after they made the, the disclosure? Um, I've got no direct evidence of that. I mean, what I clearly have is a relationship with the unions and uh, the police staff associations. There have been no concerns brought to my notice in the last two months in terms of the, um, issues around um, how people have felt supported. But that, that is the broader point I'm making at the start, is we've got some, some good initiatives, some good SOPs, Integrity Matters and the others that I went through with you. What I need to understand is, you know, as we go forward, how do we make sure that we've got the best possible position in this organisation to support staff, to, make, to enable them to come forward? You know, they, there's a range of routes through that. There are line managers, there is Integrity Matters, there is a staff associations, there are the unions, um, you know, there is third party reporting. Uh, and you know, part of the issue around Integrity Matters taking it forward is you know, building on some of the issues that the, uh, the chairman has made in terms of uh, does it deal with the totality of concerns? I need to reassure myself that, that we are in that position. Um, can, can we introduce a third party element to it? So that may or may not involve the police authority or a third party who, who staff, if they really are in a position where they don't trust the organisation to the extent that they really don't feel they can connect with the organisation around these matters, they do connect elsewhere and we are able to respond to those issues. Because you know that's the organisation I want to lead, where staff feel engaged, they feel supported, they're confident coming forward, and that it's fair both to the, um, the individuals and also the individuals about whom issues are being raised, uh, or, or systems and processes where we, we are not potentially getting it right. No, thank you very much for I, I'm going to let somebody else come in, yeah. Christian, and you can come back yeah. to you, because you've had quite a whack. I think the introduction of third party is interesting, because mm. I think many of us um, on this committee, and no doubt members who are not on the committee, will have in our inboxes messages from officers who feel that if they open their mouth they're victimised 
They either have opened their mouth and they think they've been, and they're alleging they've been victimised, or they won't do it because they think they'll get victimised between within the organisation. I'm sure you'll be aware of this. Um, how far down the road of this idea of a third party to make people feel secure? Mm. After all, if you say something, you might not get promoted. Things will happen mm. in the office. You get moved. Things like this, mm. subtle, none, and not so subtle. Well, I, I, and I agree, and it's difficult to deal with an anecdote around this. Um, you know, there, there will be staff who feel like that, there will be other individuals who clearly have uh, issues because they're, they're potentially being managed in a way that they don't think appro is appropriate, but, but we may do so. So there's a broad range within that. Um, Sorry, you're, you're, could you just repeat the question? Well, I'm just, it question. was back to your third party, yeah. oh, back sorry, to something party. external yeah. from the police. You've listed a whole list of yes, things. I have. But, I mean, they're there, but I, I suspect there'll be officers out there who say, so be it, but I wouldn't. Yeah. Well, I'm not going to say anything mm. because I've seen what happens to somebody else. Now, whether it's true or not, it, it's there. And I'm sure we've had this in our inboxes. Other uh, members of the committee have had um, mm. briefings, as it were, mm. and um, stories from uh, serving officers who are not happy, who won't say anything uh, because they feel there'll be some comeback for them. Either they don't get promoted or, in fact, mm. they'll find themselves at the end of some complaint mm. aimed at them. You know, so this can happen in our big organisations. I'm asking yes, can. about your third party, which is an interesting thing well, you're well, looking at. I mean, what, I, what I'm saying is that's an area that I want to look at. What, what I'm saying is that, you know, in the eight weeks I've been here, I've seen some good practice. I've seen some areas where I think we need to reassure ourselves that we are in the best possible position as an organisation. We, we should aspire, and I do, to be the leading police service in the UK. Uh, and that, invo that involves making sure staff are confident and feel supported. You know, whether, whether, whether it's a reality or their perception, if members of staff are feeling like that with justification, then there's a real issue. Right. And, and I recognise that, which is why I've, I've said what I've said, is, is that I'm not trying to present that this organisation is in the perfect place. I think, you know, I've worked in, this is the sixth police force or law enforcement agency I've worked in, um, some of whom have gone through enormous amounts of upheaval and change. That, that does uh, cause issues for staff. But we need to make sure that we develop the best possible response, and that's what I'm hoping to do. Margaret, sorry. It's, yes, it's still an issue of um, whistleblowing, and mm -hmm. to tease out this unease um, with the term, because it is a term that resonates with the public, and they do tend to think that it, it ensures transparency in an organisation. And my understanding is it's sometimes referred to as making a disclosure, blowing the whistle, and that to be in covered by whistleblowing law, uh, a worker who makes a disclosure or whistleblows must believe two things. One, that they're acting in the public interest, and secondly, that the worker must reasonably believe the disclosure tends to show past, present, or likely future wrongdoing. And then there's various categories. If we were to establish that as the grounds for the term whistleblowing, could we accept that we're quite happy with the term and it can be used? Uh, um, I, I wouldn't want to overstate this at all, um, Convener. Uh, uh, there is just, all, all I'm aware of is there are a range of views around the term whistleblowing. That I, I, it doesn't offend me, but, but it has some, some people would say it has some pejorative context around it. The, the real issue here is the ones that you've made, is that making sure that staff who feel that way are able to exercise their voice to be heard to feel safe to feel secure and to be confident the organization when it's appropriate will act on that and that's what i want to be uh, in a position to do yeah. if i could now turn to the spa audit and risk committee and the spa's review before you get to that you back yeah. to whistleblow is that that was a very it's, okay girl is it still it's on that? all whistleblowing because i took a particular interest in this in 2014 having had a complaint from an officer during the Commonwealth Games who was very reluctant to, um, to express his concerns. Now, at that time, I wrote to the Cabinet Secretary and got some very inf in useful information. It was the former Cabinet Secretary. So I was somewhat surprised that um, we are now saying that we didn't really have a policy in whistleblowing when he told me that um, it's been in place, I think, Safe Call Limited, mm was mentioned today and um, he was certainly of the opinion that that was a, a function or a, a process in place where um, police officers could raise their concerns. That was followed up with an FOI from my office 
and I can tell you today, and I'm surprised it hasn't come out in the review from SPA, that in October 2000, uh, that in 2013, there were 15 referrals to Police Scotland through that. It's, it's run in the northeast of England, but the ones referring to Police Scotland that affected Police Scotland in 2015 were 15 referrals. 12 of these cases were concluded. And in 2014, there were 18 referrals with 10 cases concluded. So it rather begs the question, if we are now looking at 133, that's a good news story. Mm. And I'd rather like to know why SPA hadn't gone back in its review and done something as elementary as look at the, the actual data, saying where are we now and where have we progressed to? Mr Foley looks as if he wants to respond to that. Y yes, th thank you, convener. Uh, yes, indeed, your figures are correct. Uh, at, at that time, uh, Police Scotland did operate the system which was known as Safe Call, which was uh, whistleblowing, uh, effectively. Uh, the numbers were low, uh, as you suggest, and the reason for the review uh, of Safe Call and the implementation of Integrity Matters uh, was to improve uh, the opportunities that people had uh, to make referrals uh, through Integrity Matters, so to encourage people uh, to actually uh, make more contact over issues that presented themselves within Police Scotland, and that's what happened. Uh, the Integrity Matters uh, papers were presented uh, and discussed at the SPA board and uh, certainly at the Audit and Risk Committee that's been at Audit and Risk uh, Committee on a number of occasions, uh, and again, uh, most recently as uh, January uh, of this year, and uh, Police Scotland took away some actions to uh, review uh, some elements of it and come back again. Uh, Can to I stop you there, Mr Foley? Yeah. The point I'm making is I have the figures here. You've been asked for them just a few minutes ago and you seemed unable to produce them. I didn't have the exact figures uh, with me, but the numbers, when you say them, are broadly in line with my recollection of what the numbers were. It would have been helpful if, in replying to that answer, you had said, I don't have them with me, well, but I well, certainly do have... Now, this is an important point, yes, convener. Yes, you need to reprimand them, though. I think uh, the point is made. That uh, you I, th I think it's an important it. point. Excuse please, please, just Sorry. a moment, just a moment. I think the point is made, but you've made a good point. Let's go on. Well, if we're getting <coughs> a, a good analysis of where Police Scotland is falling down and where it's improving, I think it's important we come to committee with that information for the committee to make these decisions. Can I also ask just, um, perhaps for Mr Gormley, how decisions and policy which affect personal operation policing um, are communicated to staff? Now, this is this is on operational policy. Yes, but yeah. I want to go back, just keep back at whistle, because I've got a couple of people want to come in on whistleblowing. Right. Before you, I've got Gil, then I've got Rod. Then we'll move yeah. on to communications. <coughs> well, yeah, thanks very much. Uh, a couple of uh, my colleagues have asked most of the questions I wanted to ask in the first place. Um, but I would suggest uh, uh, to, to the, the panel that we all know what whistleblowing means, and it would be a good idea you know, in your review, and I very much welcome that, I think it's a good idea, that we actually use the term because everybody in, yeah. in, in public life, we know exactly what it means and, and then we can refer to it in that way. I, but I wondered if, if, uh, if, you know, on the question that Margaret Mitchell asked, I wonder if you have these figures that you could, maybe not at the present time, if you could provide these figures that would give us a good steer, put some flesh in the bones to know what we're talking about. And at the same time, it's always good. It's good to know if progress has been made. And I wonder if, and I'm sure you don't have these figures in any case at this time, but I wonder if there's any historical figures in relation to, to what happened in, in the previous model of uh, the eight boards that we had uh, in place, if you had these figures so that we could compare, is things getting better or is it just the same as before? Um, we will provide the figures that we've, we've got uh, to, so that there are exact numbers for the record. Um, going back beyond uh, the creation of Police Scotland, uh, in any data that we've been looking at has been challenging in terms of getting numbers from the original eight legacy forces. So uh, we'll, we will <coughs> attempt to do that and see if there is some trend information that we can get. But as, as I say, uh, that's proved challenging on previous occasions. I think it is encouraging that we're seeing a greater number of referrals. Um, I have to say, though, that out of a workforce of 22,000, 
uh, 130, I'm not sure, necessarily reflects success. Uh, I think that we should be seeing uh, and encouraging more response through the, the, the whistleblowing lines, uh, rather than, uh, you know, if we get to a situation where we have a large number that perhaps are not worthy of, uh, of uh, pursuing because they're, 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 they're the wrong ones, sometimes you find that, for example, whistleblowing lines can be used for HR grievances rather than necessarily for uh, what they're intended. Uh, but we should be actually seeing a higher number of, uh, of disclosures through this and then being able to work that through and monitoring the trends. So as I say, it's encouraging that it's gone up, but I'm still rather cautious that 130 out of that size of a workforce is what we should be seeing. Three <coughs> for that period. What would be useful in writing to the committee would be to tell us the breakdown. I think I have taken a note 29 related to criminality, but and the others whereof you said a general nature. Uh, quite useful in knowing what the grievances are that are referred. If you could do that, obviously it would be anonymised, but the data would be useful. And um, I think the committee would appreciate that. I'm looking around for some support, but then I'm not getting any. Yes, I am. That's good. Uh, Roddy. My point just a small point of detail too. Um, Police Scotland accepted 1st of April 2013. From what I've heard, I presume the safe call is still going on. It would be useful to know when safe call ended and integrity matters started. I haven't heard that this morning. Mm -hmm. Can you answer that? Uh, yeah. I, I think I can. I mean, again, I wasn't here, but the briefing I've been given is that um, safe call, um, the previous system safe call um, was uh, replaced by Integrity Matters, which is effectively the yes. whistleblowing policy and process on the 2nd of March 2015. 2nd of March 2015. So, um, okay. just un under a year, and as, as has already been um, alluded to, since that point, 133 in total, 29 in some form of criminality, and 104 more general. But, but, but absolutely, I'd be prepared to um, provide a more generic, uh, sorry, a more detailed breakdown of the sorts of issues that are being raised, because those are the sorts of issues I'm interested in, actually because this is about organisational learning and development and us understanding what is concerning of officers, how they are making their voices heard and how we respond when appropriate. Thank you. Margaret. Yes, if I could ask um, Mr Gromley about how decisions on policy which affect operational policing are communicated to staff. Uh, <laughs> certainly. I mean, I, I've got a flowchart which I can take people through, forgive me. Um, a lot of, I would, what I would say is a lot of it would depend on the complexity of the issue. So, you know, if it was a major legislative change that required the whole of the workforce to be reskilled or retrained, uh, and there are examples of that, then it clearly it's a very different process from a more discrete change in guidance, where we've got a much more limited impact on, on staff. So there's a, you know, there's a broad range from a very discrete change of policy or procedure around perhaps a very technical element of policing, through to a very generic requirement to retrain officers in a fundamental change in, in a legal process. But in essence, we will be notified of, of a proposal of, around either updated legislation or guidance. That will then be considered by the Strategic Leadership Board, Senior Leadership Board, which is myself and senior uh, chief officers. And we will then identify an individual who would respond to that. And it would normally be relevant to their portfolio responsibilities. So, you know, as we presently sit here, if it was fundamentally going to affect officers in local policing, that would go to Rose Fitzpatrick. If it was in the crime area, it would go, go, go to Ian and Livingston. And what they would be responsible for then is identifying what are the organisational implications. Who do we need to engage with internally and externally to understand the impact of this? So, you know, if we were going to change our response investigatively or in a procedural way, it may have knock-on implications for other agencies or stakeholders. That could be the Crown, it could be victim support, you know, it could be the third sector. There are a range of people that we would need to understand what is the impact of our proposed um, response to that change in guidance. Um, and also to offer some advice, actually, and I've been involved historically around a lot of mental health issues where we develop training and guidance for staff in terms of how to respond to people in crisis. Actually, we're not mental health professionals. There are mental health professionals, again, both third sector and statutory, helping us develop um, procedure and policy and responses to people in crisis. From that, we will then develop guidance and training material. Um, and again, I go back to the point, it depends how many people that would affect. And it also would depend on the type of change. If it was a narrow, very narrow group of individuals, that could probably be done on face-to-face -face briefings. If it's a fairly transactional piece of legislation that doesn't require a fundamental response, there are approaches around e-learning and distance learning that may or may not be appropriate. Um, we can set up intranet mini-sites so allow officers to train themselves around this. But a lot of it depends on, on what the issue is. 
um, um, and the issuance then of force memoranda, uh, standard operating procedures and internal guidance. Um, Let's take the big issue. Hmm. We'll be go back to the issue of armed police um, and the issue also of stop and search, which were raised and which then instructions were given out to officers about how to behave in those circumstances, what to do and what not to do. But some of them still did it because they said, apparently the communications didn't mm. get through. Now, we're not just talking about mm. small things, not really mm. big issues, mm. which were causing Police Scotland a lot of trouble. So, you know, that's the question that we're really asking about, because one of the uh, issues we had from the, um, the representatives of the officers it was that there's so much that comes through in, the inter in emails, such a plethora of information mm. that lost in amongst mm. all this are serious, mm. important bits of communication. Now, how are you addressing that? Because busy officers don't have time to read every email that comes through from HQ. No, I, and, and I don't expect some of these issues to be dealt with by, um, by email from headquarters, genuinely. Um, you know, I, I think we need to recognise where we've come from and where we need to get to. The amount of work required in the first three years, the early stages of Police Scotland, to bring together an enormous range of approaches, policy, procedure. We've lived practice. that. We've lived that with Police Scotland I'm for sure the past have. three yeah. years. So, so if, I'm just getting at these are the big issues about communication yeah. that my colleagues could, asking about. Margaret, yes. If I could give an example, mm. um, and it was Police Scotland's crime and justice division policy to issue on-the-spot warnings for the possession of cannabis rather than reporting to the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service. Now, this was obviously before you were in yeah. place, but when I, I visited local commanders, it was clear they weren't aware of the policy, and worse still, they were just embarking on an operation to crack down on drugs. Clearly a huge disconnect. Mm. Well, well I, and I'm, you know, I'm not for one moment challenging that as a description of what happened. I simply don't know. Um, but that's not where we need to be. Uh, and, and one of the issues that uh, I think I is significant for us going forward is understanding how national policy decisions impact locally. Um, and as I've gone around the country talking to staff and officers and local authority civic leaders, this is one of the issues, not specifically around training that's coming out, but around uh, us being able to hear local views about the um, impact of national decisions. Can, can I stop you there? This mm. was a decision by Police Scotland's crime, Criminal Justice Division and when I queried yep. it with some of the, the senior management, they said the real um, motivation for this was the Crown Procurator Fiscal, Fiscal Service were just so overwhelmed. Um. It was faster to do this. Well, I, I genuinely can't comment on that. Um, I'm happy to go on. Uh, the point I was okay. perhaps clumsily making was in response to the convener's issue around yeah. um, communication mm -hmm. and national decisions around th things like stop search, arming of officers and how they're deployed. Uh, our ability to understand how that lands locally, its impact on some very diverse communities because what people would regard as normal and acceptable in Glasgow and Edinburgh will be different in the Highlands and Islands. And that's been made very clear oh, to me. As going that's national my point. things. These were not local. No, that's my point. Is, is, but it was a national decision to, uh, in terms of the arming of officers in Scotland. The position. Well, it wasn't the arming. It was the being in public places. Yes. Yeah, that's and, then, the point. and there was a big stushy, which yeah. I'm sure you're aware yeah. of. And then mm. Police Scotland I've said this had been remedied. Everybody knew where they mm. were, but they didn't. Mm. And, and that's a big, that's a big mm. issue that should have been something that's that all point. officers were aware of, mm. including. Mm the issues of stop and search, the so-called you know, voluntary stop and search. Mm. But we still had it happening, despite a couple of colleagues here um, you know, having a good mm. go at it for mm. a very long time. Mm. And it's to do with communications. Mm. We're back yeah. to this. I, I'm, I'm, I think we're probably violently agreeing. So it's nothing to do with local issues, like whether it's well, happening well, in the well, gas I think, market. Well, I think, or I'm sorry, I think the broader point around communications it is, and the point I'm attempting to make not very well, is that us, for us to understand how when we make local de lo national decisions around national functions, yes. we understand how that will affect local communities who have a very different demand from, from policing. So the, the, the culture and practice and relevance well, of a policing so approach in Glasgow Chief will be Council, very different me, from Highlands and Islands. Let me stop you there. Mm. I perfectly understand okay. the difference between a Rami in the grass market and a Rami in a wee village yeah. and what people would expect maybe in the grass market at 2 o'clock on a Sunday morning after the various clubs. That's not what we're talking about. Mm. We're talking about uh, go back to the issue of armed police being in the supermarket or whatever out in public and also stop and search. Mm. That issue of the policy and the way it was used, would, wherever you were, was to be sorted. Mm. There's nothing about tweaking it for different mm. areas. 
And that did not get through to officers, mm. certain officers mm. on the beat. Mm. That's the bit about communicating. It's not that... We understand that okay. stuff about different policing cultures yeah. in different areas. Okay. So is that... These are the issues about communicating. Is that sorted now? Is that ever... You know, if we get a big decision like that, is it going to be sorted <laughs> well, so that well, we don't have it happening again? Well, I, I would be foolish to sit here and give a 100% guarantee because in organisational life, with 23,000 3, people uh, and the complexity of what we deal with, w will we make mistakes in the future? I suspect we probably will. Is our ambition to make sure that when we're introducing new pieces of legislation or significant changes of working practice, that we've got a thought through process that ensures that we identify a lead for this, we identify the right means of communication, we ensure staff have the right guidance and training and understand what they're going to do. Yes, we do have a policy and process in relation to that. I hope the examples we've given have been helpful. Have. And you know, I know that you'll go back and, and look at them and yeah. see where um, communication can be improved. Okay. I mean, some of the problems that have happened for Police Scotland, frankly, were of their own making. Mm. I have to say it's historic now with you there, okay. but they were of their own making, and, and that's what we're asking to be addressed so that it doesn't happen again. Mm. Um, I've now got Elaine, please. Yes, uh, thank you. And uh, welcome to the new Chief Constable. Thank you. Um, Maybe wishes he hadn't taken the job by now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very pleased I did. Uh, I wanted to look a little bit around... Um, because we're running out of time. Of <laughs> another <few laughs> I, <know. laughs> yeah, um, I know that the uh, HMS EIS is, in, uh, is conducting an inquiry into the breach of the Acquisition and Disclosure of Communications Data Code of Practice. Yeah. Uh, but we've been told that that actually was due to an oversight, which meant that the changes in the code didn't get to the single point of contact in the counter-corruption unit. Uh, are you, have you been appraised as to why this is, and are you con confident that there are procedures in place now to, to make sure that this type of thing doesn't either in specific to this, this, this particular type of information or indeed other important decisions that this type of oversight won't happen again? Uh, y yes, I am. Uh, I mean, I've been briefed on the circumstances around that breach. Um, you've clearly heard evidence from mm -hmm. ACC Nicholson and before him, DCC Richardson, where we accept absolutely that mistakes and oversights were made. In, in terms of that specific set of issues, there's an action plan. Uh, we've responded to the recommendations emanating from uh, the learning in that. And I, I am confident around that set of issues that we are uh, in a place where that will not be repeated. Um, the HMICS will report back, I think, in the spring, spring is yep. their timeline. Um, clearly, we'll reflect very carefully on those recommendations, <laughs> and I will take those forward. Um, we were advised that um, one officer did actually raise some concerns about the application, but somehow their concerns mm. weren't taken forward. Mm. And again, <coughs> can we be confident that in the future that if an officer does raise concerns about a particular issue, that the channels of communication are such that their concerns are taken seriously? Well, my ambition is, is, is exactly that. I mean, it, clearly we've got um, two processes in train at the moment. One is the HMICS review, which will look at the circumstances of this case and come back with some observations and recommendations, which we as an organisation will clearly take seriously and act on. We've got a, an IPT, an Investigatory Powers Tribunal, which clearly is a judicial, quasi-judicial process. Again, we'll put some judgments out of the back of that. Um, at the end of that, I don't rule anything in or anything out in terms of what we then subsequently need to do as an organisation. Um, so uh, there are actions that have been taken, a robust action plan that's been commented on favourably by IOCO in terms of our response to that set of circumstances. We've then got a broader review by the HMICS into the counter-corruption unit and the circumstances that led to this apparent um, breakdown of communication, stroke misinterpretation, stroke mistakes. Um, we've got an IPT which will come to a conclusion and at the end of that will be lessons to be learned maybe on an individual and an organisational basis mm -hmm. and you have my absolute commitment that we'll respond to that. Mm -hmm. Yes, because we were, as convenience reminding we were advised that the, it had been reckless so obviously uh, we wouldn't want the, to see... Yes. That's Scotland the determination by the IPT. So it wasn't just mistakes, it was reckless. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. that is, I, I'm not disputing for one moment yeah. what ICO said, not for one moment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, obviously this is something I would imagine a future justice, Com justice committee will not survive much longer, but I'm sure a, sh a future justice committee will be interested in returning to, to some of these issues once the reports have been, ha have been published. Um, you may be aware, I don't know whether the Scottish Police Federation has contacted you directly, but they have raised with the committee concerns about aspects of the uh, counter-corruption unit um, and 
in particular with the, the same way of are they aware of members being ordered or invited to interviews which have a status that appears to sit outside criminal procedure or misconduct investigation? Has SPF uh, raised any of these concerns directly, either with yourself as Chief Constable or with the SPA? Yes, Mr. Uh, yes, the, uh, the SPF has raised those concerns with us, and it is a, a, a focal point of the HMICS uh, uh, investigation and review. Uh, and just to, to clarify in terms of your earlier question, uh, HMI is looking at the broader aspects of counter-corruption rather than the issues uh, that IOCO uh, raised because that's IOCO's yeah. role in terms of yes. that. Mm -hmm. There is a linkage between the two in terms of the overall operation of the unit and how those things may come up. So there may be uh, lessons to be learned around uh, the IOCO issues uh, that come out of the HMICS uh, report. Uh, but actually, their uh, work is more focused on what the issues that the SPF have uh, raised uh, with us. That's interesting, actually, yes, because uh, we get the impression, really, that they're a sort of a, a standalone policing unit which is developing its own particular culture. And, you know, it's it, yeah. in fact. Mm. Uh, so and, and obviously, again, I know that you won't be able to comment fully until the S until we see the report. Uh, I mean, the, the work is ongoing. The field work is ongoing at the moment. Until we see that report, we can't really comment. No, on, but you're not uh, doing nothing do. while you're waiting for the report. <coughs> surely, I mean, you know, I mean, the report's important, but you obviously, I hope, Police Scotland, the SBA, are doing something just now. I, I, I think uh, I'd leave but that to the Chief Constable to uh, comment on the actions mm -hmm. that are taking place just now. Well, I mean. Yes, the, 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 the review from the HMICS is, is critically important to us understanding whether, you know, whether those perceptions, whether those observations from the Federation um, have, have a basis, and I'm not saying whether they do or they don't, but I need to understand where the HMICS sees this issue. Um, the Federation have not directly raised that matter with me yet. I'm sure they will subsequent to this meeting, to this um, uh, committee meeting. So you're not really, um, you're just waiting for this report, and then you'll do something. I'm just trying to understand. Well, this, this report, well, th there are a range of issues that have been I raised. I know there are. Well, I'm, I'm just trying to help mm -hmm. the committee, forgive me. There are a range of issues that have been raised by um, IOCO, by uh, a broader view about the proportionality of how counter-corruption units nationally and locally operate. This review will give us the basis to understand what is actually going on. Um, and I will respond to that review. We've got, you know, this is what is happening. They are looking at the culture and the practice and the approach of the counter-corruption unit. If that, if that independent review raises, the, that raises issues that support this um, description, then we'll act. What's going to be use of timeline, do you think, for... What's our timeline? Sorry. I mean, what, you know, once you get this review, what's your timeline and well, I mean, asp I aspirational timeline, if you like, in, in terms of the actions you're going to take thereafter? Well, it depends what the recommendations are, very clearly. I mean, if, if they deliver this in, uh, in the spring, and I've got no reason to suggest that they won't, um, th there could be a range of recommendations from, you know, there needs to be a fundamental rethink in terms of the approach to actually um, this is in reasonable shape. Mm -hmm. uh, and between those two parameters, re a large set of decisions. So if it required a fundamental shift in our approach or our um, response to these issues, well, that will take longer. So it, it's very difficult until we see the recommendations to understand what the response needs to look like. But we will move, I will move as quickly as I can. Will you involve the um, various professional bodies in this as well, engage with them in, once this review is published? Um, the likes of the SPF and so on. Well, I mean, uh, yes. I, I'm, again, I need, I need to understand what the... It's very difficult to Absolutely, speculate on, on what on a report... In principle, you well, in be engaging in, with... My, my, my in-principle position is always to engage with staff associations and the unions. That's my rebuttable presumption because that's good leadership, that's good management. Uh, and, you know, these issues around communication, if we don't have federation, staff associations, other representative bodies helping us shape and make the right decisions, they're unlikely to be the best decisions that could be made. So, so subject to the view that there may be some technical issues here that are out with the federation yeah. purview, what I would want is the federation, staff associations, staff associations and the unions to have confidence in our response. Uh, that's the position that I want to get to, and that will involve, of course, consulting with them. Because um, I recollect the SPF 
don't have. I mean, they took the line and uh, the view that the counter corruption unit was, I'll put it in com a, a law unto itself, it sort of just operated to limb and nobody really knew what it was doing. Uh, uh, that didn't putting it in well, blunt well, terms. I don't, I, don't, I don't agree with that characterisation. No, but it was their position. Yeah. Mr. Flanagan, what's the role of the SPA in all this when this report comes out? What's your remit? It, it, Do you SP have one here? Uh, yes, uh, okay. it's the SPA that has commissioned uh, the uh, HMICS to do the uh, review uh, and the report will come to us and okay. then uh, we will have uh, a position to work uh, on the recommendations with a, uh, coming with an action plan on Police Scotland to address the recommendations within an appropriate timescale. Uh, so yes, we have, a, we, we have a, a, a central role in terms of the outcome of this review. Sorry, is somebody else coming in on this? Are you this you're finished? Who, it, John, are you in on this subject? Is this you? You're down on my list. Full stop. Uh, uh, you are, you are. Off you go. The floor is yours. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Um, <coughs> firstly, uh, well done in the review, Chief Constable. I think that, that's, uh, that's welcome that systems have been looked at. So a question, first and foremost, for the, the police authority. Um, we know the new systems changed um, in the 2nd of March and your report's published in June 2015, so presumably that was a report about the previous system. Can I leave Mr Foley yeah. to answer that one since I wasn't uh, there at the time? No, that, that was actually a report on the, the current system at that point in time, so the processes had changed on the 2nd of March and they were carrying out the review post that, so it was on the new uh, system. <coughs> but there can't have been much time to gain an understanding with the experience of the new system um, in that turnaround, Mr. Foley. Well, so some of it uh, was in relation to the actual operation of the new system, and some of it was a review of the documentation which had been produced as well. So the new documentation came into effect on the 2nd of March also, so there was a review carried out in relation to that. Okay, okay. Um, right. Uh, and in relation to that, um, the report concluded that increased effectiveness of Police Scotland SPA whistleblowing process within the wider CCU unit should be significant for increasing awareness for officers and staff. So uh, key, key to the progress of whistleblowing or, or mm. officers having confidence is the role of the CCU as far as the authority is concerned. Yes. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. I, I wonder in relation to that, Chief Constable, um, pe people might be surprised, and I know you're inheriting a situation that when you're... Um, the gentleman who acts um, prior to your appointment, who is isn't also the disciplinary authority, is aware of these serious accusations made by the Scottish Police Federation that you will await the outcome of a third party's report before acting. Do you know if Mr Richardson initiated anything on the basis of the comments made by the Federation that the CCU had scant regard for rules of fairness or proportionality, which after all they're supposed to be custodians of ensuring? Um, I, don't, I don't specifically know the answer to that question. What, what I would say is, the, you know, in terms of what I think the question you're asking me is, and forgive me if I'm getting mm -hmm. this wrong, is we need to review and understand whether there is anything in these allegations um, being made, uh, allegations is a strong word, we, we, I don't mean it in that sense, in, the, in these issues that the Federation are raising with us. The, the way to do that is to get uh, an independent review of the operation of the counter-corruption unit and that is what the HMI CS is doing and that's what I need to understand as a response to it you know that that is the appropriate body to um, to provide us with the information to understand whether we need to whether we need to amend our approach and in what way no I am commending the role of an okay. independent body but you don't see any if you like line management issues connected with that pending the publication of a, a, a report which after all might mean that malpractice has continued for several months prior to the publication of the report? Um, I, I, I've seen no evidence or information to suggest to me that there's malpractice occurring. Um, you know, I, I, I will take a view when I get the report in terms of whether there are any line management issues. Okay, 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 okay. And um, d so did the Police Scotland have a say in the, the um, terms of reference of the inspectorate report into this? Um, we were asked to um, have a, we, well the answer to that is yes. I think in my first week here I was provided with a copy of the um, terms of reference by um, Mr Penman uh, and I had no comment to make. They looked fit for purpose from my point of view. Okay, okay. And uh, Mr Flanagan, is it unlikely authority will revisit the situation? Um, my colleague um, Elaine Murray talked about um, 
again, a high-profile instance where a, an officer expressed concerns about, a senior officer expressed concerns. This was known to chief officers in Police Scotland. Um, Police Authority wouldn't be visiting that again prior to the publication of this report? If, if there was a specific uh, complaint raised with us, then yes, we would. Uh, but mm -hmm. uh, at, at this stage, uh, I'm, I'm not aware of one. See, the, ch the, chal the challenge is w w the for, for elected representatives is that we, we do have contact, regular contact with police officers who are our constituents, mm -hmm. and they know quite appropriately in many instances that action is taken on fairly flimsy uh, evidence. If, if, if when any report allegation or complaint to me reasonably unfaired as the terms, um, a report <laughs> must go to the fiscal. But here we have very high profile public hearing, if you like, where these serious accusations are made and we're to understand that we've just to wait several months before the people who the public might look to, namely the authority and the chief officer act on them. Yes, if I, I could try and respond to that. If if there is a specific allegation that the Federation on behalf of a member wants to make to me, then I will act on it. Of course I will. And I will take a view about whether it's appropriate, depending on what the nature of the complaint is and who is being complained about, as to whether that is appropriately investigated by our professional standards department, the CCU, PERC, or, or an external uh, third party. There are a range of responses to that. As I sit here, I have not had that formal complaint from the Federation or, or in terms of a specific set of allegations. If they have those concerns, then I would ask them to come to me and raise them with me. The more general issue, which as described by other uh, members of the committee of, a, of an organisation within an organisation that's setting its own rules, I, don't, I have seen nothing to support that broad characterisation. Uh, and that is the issue that the, that the HMICS will take a view on in terms of the operating um, context and the way in which the CCU discharges its duty. But if you know, if the Federation or members of the Federation have specific complaints to make against officers of any rank in any part of the organisation, then they need to make them to me and I will deal with it. Okay, no. And in relation to the CCU, do you think long term they're the appropriate recipients of complaints from officers? What's the role, for instance, connected with you know, HR or the uh, professional standards department? Well, well, I think in organisational life there are a range of issues from... Um, people who are unhappy or don't understand what they're being asked to do, individual issues around grievance, so, you know, uh, tensions between line managers and staff, you know, that, which don't fall into conduct or discipline matters. Yeah. So it depends where on that spectrum of organisational issue you are. So, so there is, you know, just good line management. There are grievance issues. There is then whistleblowing, which is more about concerns, not about an individual's treatment, but a, you know, the, 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 a practice or a custom or a response that is regarded to be not in the public interest by the person raising that, through to conduct in terms of professional standards, through to high-end corruption. Um, and let's be clear, there is not a police service in the UK that doesn't need to have a very robust response to corruption. It's a live issue in every law enforcement agency. Um, so we do, need, you know, but, but what we need is a proportionate response. You know, we, we, you know, we, we shouldn't be launching CCU investigations against inappropriate pieces of behaviour um, any more than we should attempt to be dealing with serious corruption through um, a sort of informal line management conversation. It is about understanding what's the nature of the complaint, what's, what's, what's the position of the complainant in terms of their potential vulnerability in the organisation, what do they need supporting, supportively wrapped around them as they go through a process, be it you know, a grievance, uh, a conduct matter, or a corruption allegation. So to answer your question in a sort of a sorry, slightly rambling way, I think it's absolutely determined by the nature of the allegation. Um, I, I think people would understand clear procedures would apply mm -hmm. in criminal matters and in misconduct matters. Mm -hmm. I think the issue is matters out with that. Would you confirm that a police officer who is the subject of the attention of the CCU can only be a witness, a suspect, and an accused? They can't have any other status. Um, I suppose instinctively that sounds right, yes. Okay. Well, well, a w witness, suspect, accused, or complainant, actually. Well, they could okay. be the complainant. Sorry, I'm just trying yes, to think yes, it through. Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Indeed, yeah. indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you yeah. very much indeed. I just want to follow up on this business of the uh, cases referred to the Crown, because, again, it may be anecdotal, but certainly passing through my inbox, cases where officers have been reported to the Crown and they have waited a considerable period of time to know whether or not they are going to be prosecuted. Um, I would like to know um, the figures for that because at the end of the day, 
how long rapists they're in, they're suspended in no man's land, or he or she's suspended in no man's land, there's a cloud hanging over them, they're given paper jobs to do or something uh, at, at work. Um, I'd like to know the length of time and how many actually proceed to a criminal prosecution, because there is a whiff sometimes, I, I know no more than this, is simply recounting what I am told, a whiff that this is being used in a vengeful way sometimes, by somebody whose face doesn't fit. And uh, they might then be referred to the Crown and, you know, lives fall apart and everything like that, and nothing happens at the end of all that. Now, I just put that to you, because probably you are aware of all this already. I'd like to know the statistics and how many of these, how long it takes for the Crown to decide whether or not to prosecute, let's take those 29 cases, and it, how many prosecutions then follow. I'm very happy to provide that to the committee. I, d I don't have those figures with me. Um, but I share your concern around the impact on officers of being, and actually on the public purse and on the service we should provide to the public, of having officers um, either restricted or suspended for very long periods. You know, I've seen that throughout my career, how yes. damaging that can be for officers who are ultimately, many of, some of whom have not actually been found to have um, committed the offences that they've been accused of. There is a range of issues here. I'll happily get the figures for you in terms of and the... And that underlying thing, which may not always be the case, but sometimes may be the case that it's a form of revenge. Well, I, I, I would be very concerned about taken. that. It, you know, that, that's a very serious matter. It is indeed. And, and I will take that seriously. There, there is a broad issue around public confidence in terms of how effectively the police deal with its own when complaints are made. So I have seen this from the other perspective as well, where there is a complete absence, well, not a complete, a lack of confidence in the public that when allegations of misbehaviour, either internally or externally, mm -hmm. by police officers are made, that they are not robustly and appropriately dealt with. That. So there, there is a balance here to be struck between that. public confidence and treating staff fairly. Absolutely appreciate the balance and mm -hmm. perception. Um, Margaret, you've come in because you've not been in yet. Do you want to come Thank in? Thank you, Convener. Uh, it's really on the general uh, communication within the police. I, in the, the staff survey, which we had the report of in September last year, the particular issues were raised around internal engagement, uh, including heavy reliance on cascading information by email and through the intranet, where personal methods such as through the line management or team shift briefings were preferred. Mm. So what's been done to address that then? Has things changed since September? Uh, things are in the process of changing, um, uh, and I recognise the issues coming out of the staff survey. Since that um, survey was delivered to us, uh, and I take no responsibility for this, this is those that went before, there have been 43 chief officer-led staff engagement exercises to understand what are the issues that sit underneath the staff survey. Um, so that's been a significant effort on behalf of the organisation to follow up and, and really understand what, what sits beneath those high-level headlines. Um, Again, just as part of my own personal learning as I uh, embed myself in Police Scotland, I've done seven personal uh, staff engagements where actually I've just wanted to understand how does it feel from your point of view? What is it that we need to do? You know, actually what I've found is a staff that are hugely motivated, passionate and delivering brilliant service day and night for the people of Scotland. So, you know, it, it's an enormously humbling to see the quality of staff that we have and are joining this organisation. They're doing fantastic work. In terms of what that then adds up to, there are four broad themes that come out of those workshops. Firstly, improving leadership, and that's across the whole of the organisation. On some levels, it is probably understandable when you're bringing that number of organisations together at that speed, with that level of grip required, that there may be an over-reliance on email. I think we're now at the position where we need to understand what is good leadership, and that is about listening and talking to people and recognising where information is best provided through um, email and you know transactionally that's that's that will have to be the way in a national organization where the visibility of senior leaders will always be a challenge but we need to support leadership at every level in the organization um, so that you know, our leaders are confident and we provide them with the sorts of information they need in order to brief their staff and that we also have a conduit back so we can understand and hear what they're saying um, th there is a second issue around engaging and valuing each other so for me, that touches on our approach to performance. How do we spot people doing things right? 
What are our re reward and recognition processes? How do we celebrate great work? And what are the sorts of things that we say are important to enable staff to deliver on their sense of vocation and, and to deliver their professional judgment? Third piece is around our voice, which is about them being heard. And it goes back to probably where we started. At its most serious end, it is about them being able to, with confidence, to ex escalate issues uh, 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 that are causing them concern around conscience or conduct. But more importantly, it's about how do we make sure they're part of designing this service. What I've seen is staff who are massively committed. And as we go on the next stage of the evolution of Police Scotland, you know, it's landed. We now need to transform it. We now need to understand, within the limits of what you can do in a 23,000-person organisation, to really understand how staff can... Because they know the answers to the problems, particularly in local communities. I, I will not from Stirling. And the other fourth element is what they've described as exciting experience, which is actually, this is a brilliant job to be in. Uh, and actually, it provides enormous opportunities to make the difference to people's lives in the community when it really matters. And it's about enabling them to deliver on that set of excitement. So we are now at the process where we've gone through 43 workshops. I've done some triangulation personally since I've been here. We've got four broiled areas of work, and we're developing, you know, we keep coming back to action plans, but we're going to develop approaches around all of those areas that I think will move Police Scotland on in terms of the staff survey. Um, and, and actually, it's about just being a bit humane, being, having a degree of humility about being prepared to listen and recognise you may not have got it completely right, um, enabling staff to be prepared to make mistakes within parameters, encouraging them to innovate, deliver locally in a way that makes best sense to them and their people. That, that's the organisation we need to move from. You know, one from which is heavily reliant on, reliant on compliance through to one where actually the ambition is around discretionary effort, where people know the values of the organisation and they're able to respond and deliver. Mm -hmm. So would you say there has been a reduction in the number of emails that are sent to officers yeah. since yeah. the survey? Yeah. I don't know. This is short answer. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't dream of trying to bamboozle you. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm too old and ho uh, hoary to do that. The simple answer is I don't know. Uh, in terms of the numbers <laughs> of emails. There, there is a preference for, you know, the one time. I, I don't have a preference for email. You know, the, the, the preference okay. for briefings. Yeah. Well, yes, there is, absolutely. And what, what, one of the things that, are, that we are doing is, to, is, is strengthening our internal communications department because actually we need to provide staff, you know, um, supervisors, leaders, with good briefing material. Actually, there should be a set of core messages or issues mm -hmm. that on a monthly basis we are able to distill out and say to, you know, in accessible, plain English, these are the issues that your, your individual guys and girls need to know about. And actually, we need to hear back from you what those issues are. We need to embark on, you know, it's, out, it's very easy for me, isn't it, to come in and do this, but actually the visibility of the Chief Officer team, how we develop an ongoing programme of staff engagement whereby we're not responding on the back of a, an unhelpful or difficult survey. It becomes how we lead the organisation in terms of our own visibility. Now, you know, we are a relatively small chief officer team in a 23,000-person organisation. You know, there's a responsibility for everybody who stepped forward into a leadership role, role from sergeant uh, through. Now, the higher up you are, the bigger the responsibility. But we need to move away from a transactional, email-driven organisation, if that's where we are, to one where what I have just described in an attempt to bamboozle you, convener, is where I would wish us to be. <laughs> yeah, it's, I just, it was just no. delicious. It was a I delicious was, was, move. Admit it. Was, After all that, you get I, so I many I admire the way the ball was crossed and how you're headed at home, convener. <laughs> so I'll never forget that one, Margaret. That's going down in history. Well, yeah. I'm afraid I can only take one more question. I'm sorry. No, I've got another member. I did can tell you about this. This is the one and only chance of the members to ask questions. And we've got a stage two uh, straight after this, the okay. Cabinet Secretary is waiting. Um, very quickly. I just uh, wanted to follow through just uh, briefly on... Uh, it has on, to be brief. It is brief, convener, on, on, from the, the staff survey following on some of the questions that Margaret has put. Uh, obviously, we've heard a lot about the steps you've been taking mm. to try a, and improve that internal communication. In the staff survey, under the heading commitment, 33% of all respondents indicated an intention to leave for a whole variety of reasons, although, mm. to be fair, it was suggested when asked the factors that were adversely affecting the commitment to the organisation, 49% said changes to pensions. Yeah. But you might care to remind me about um, when the next start survey will be uh, 
undertaken. And, and, and is, it, is, it, is it your view at the present time, after two months in the job, that morale is much better now than it was in September? I will pitch. I mean, it would, it would be a very brave Chief Constable who sat here two months in and said everything's fixed, morale is great. All I can give you is some anecdotes in the way you've provided to me. As I've gone out and spoken to staff, um, I don't necessarily see the workforce reflected in that, um, in that survey. I, I see passionate, committed individuals who want to make a difference. And, and in terms of the re repetition. Could I deal with the specific of the question in terms of uh, the, when we s set out the first uh, survey, we said that we would repeat it in two years' time, yeah. but that we would take a temperature check uh, within 12 months. A temperature check is a more focused, narrow uh, testing of, uh, of opinions around the key issues that came out of the first one and that would take place uh, through the late summer of, of this year. And that is intended, uh, in terms of our actions, uh, you need to have completed some of the actions early enough so that when this temperature check comes back, you're actually beginning to see some reaction to the things that you've done to try to address these issues. Uh, thank you. I have to, I have to stop the <coughs> overrun. Can I thank you very much for attendance? I apologise. No, I apologise to Mr. Finlay. I did warn that this session was very. There's no points of order in committee. I suspend now for three minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Maybe you should come on time.
Thank you very much. Now I move on to item two, the Abuse of Behaviour and Sexual Harm Scotland Bill. I'm going to try to get through all the amendments today, so um, nice, short, sharp speeches. Uh, you should have your copies of the bill, the marshal list and the groupings of amendment for today's consideration. And uh, I welcome Michael Matheson, Cabinet Secretary of Justice and his officials, to the meeting. And of course, I don't need to tell you that they're in a supporting ca capacity and cannot speak during proceedings. They know that and you know that. Right. Um, I now move on and I'm moving straight to the amendments. And I call Amendment 50, uh, 69, I beg your pardon, in the name of Margaret Mitchell, in a group on its own. Margaret, to move and speak to your amendment. Thank you, Convener. This is an amendment lodged on behalf of the Law Society uh, of Scotland. It restricts the test for domestic abuse aggravation to intent rather than intent or recklessness to cause a partner or ex-partner to suffer physical or psychological harm. It's lodged as a probing amendment to generate further discussion about the inclusion of recklessness. In its submission to the Justice Committee prior to Stage 1, the Law Society expressed concern about the inclusion of the aggravation provision, which it stated would in practice be difficult to prove because of the requirement to establish intention or recklessness. This in turn, it thought, would serve to risk having the perverse effect of limiting the application of the domestic abuse aggravation, which is supposed to help ensure that such acts are treated by the courts with the seriousness that they deserve. Furthermore, it's it was established during stage one scrutiny, there is no requirement for a past pattern of abusive behaviour to be set out in the charge. In other words, it would apply to a first offence. Um, whilst I believe the intent test is robust and objective, I have some concerns that the adoption of the recklessness test for a first offence, as opposed to a second or subsequent uh, offences, where a pattern of behaviour is established is potentially more subjective. So I'm less concerned about the technicalities of the amendment, which I, I think may be um, faulty. I, I readily accept that. The, the, the point in raising this and um, moving this amendment is purely to generate some more discussion around the issue and to hear the, the, ca the, the Cabinet Secretary's comment, uh, comments on the issue, particularly on the first offence and recklessness issue. So you moved it, Margaret. Oh, sorry, I moved no, it. I think you did, actually, yeah. in the middle yeah. of all that, but just to make it clear. Um, any other members wish to speak on this? Oh, Elaine, then Roddy, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Convener. Uh, I'm uh, opposed this amendment. Um, I think it would provide abusers with a uh, defence that said that I didn't mean to do it, and I, I would uh, be very. I, I, I listened to what the Law Society had to say in their evidence to us, but I'm afraid I don't accept that. I think it is. Uh, would be dangerous, if you like, uh, to remove the recklessness part because it would provide that degree of, of defence to uh, perpetrators. Roddy. Yeah, I concur with uh, the views that Lane's already expressed about the, the wideness of it. And just looking back at the Law Society's evidence, they seem to be instinctively of the view that um, domestic abuse cases are given a lot of special attention in the courts at the present time and that adding an aggravation would, would somehow be a, a step too far. I'm not really sure in many respects I understand the Law Society's position uh, beyond that, but, and obviously I'd be grateful for um, further comment from the Cabinet Secretary on the issue of recklessness. And on cue, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, uh, Convener. Amendment uh, 69 it relates to the domestic abuse aggravator in Section 1 of the uh, bill. Uh, the bill currently provides that where an offence is committed against uh, an offender's partner or ex-partner, it is sufficient to prove that the accused was reckless as to whether in committing the offence they would cause their partner or ex-partner physical or psychological harm in order for the aggravator to operate. Amendment 69 would in fact restrict the circumstances in which the aggravator would operate so that it was only uh, offences that involved abuse of a person's partner or ex-partner where it is proven that the accused intended in committing the offence 
to cause their partner or ex-partner to suffer physical or psychological harm. We have taken the approach uh, we have in the bill because we consider that where, for example, a person commits a sexual offence against their partner or ex-partner or causes or assaults them, it should not be open to them to argue that the aggrava aggravation should not apply because it was not their intent to cause their partner physical or psychological harm. We consider it appropriate that in circumstances where it is a foreseeable consequence of someone's actions that their partner or ex-partner was going to suffer physical or psychological harm, that aggravation should operate, and this would mean recklessness should be included. We do not consider it should be open to offenders to argue that the aggravation does not apply because, though uh, they were reckless as uh, to whether uh, in committing an offence against their partner they might uh, cause them physical or psychological harm, it cannot be proven that this was their intention in committing the offence. And for that reason, we would invite members to oppose Amendment 69. Please. Probing amendment but what hasn't really been addressed in the Cabinet Secretary's um, comments and it's something that I would at least ask him to consider at stage three is this issue of recklessness when it is a first offence. Second offence, a pattern established, I have absolutely no difficulty with that but I think it's worth teasing out with the, um, with the intention of trying to make the legislation as robust as possible and giving the best um, protection to those people who suffer from domestic abuse. I won't be moving it. No, you've moved it. So are you seeking leave to withdraw? I am. <laughs> uh, you're agreed with that, are you? A life out there, yes? Yes, yes. yes. good, good. <laughs> right. Uh, the questions at section one we agreed to, are we all agreed? agreed? I call amendment 70 in the name of Margaret McDougall, group with amendment 72 to 82. Margaret McDougall, please to move amendment 70 and speak to the other amendments in the group. I move the amendments in my name. Just the one amendment, Amendment 70. Oh, you can't move them all. Right. You just move Amendment 70. I move Amendment 70. Excellent. The aim of my amendments today is to expand the disclosure section uh, within the bill. The bill before us only covers the disclosure of photographs and film. My amendment, supported by Scottish Women's Aid, seeks to broaden this to include photograph or film of an intimate situation, sound recordings containing intimate content or an intimate written communication. That, that is the purpose of Amendment 73. In my view, if we only cover disclosure of a photograph or film, a loophole is present within the bill. When it comes to sharing, say, screenshots of intimate text-based conversations or the sharing of intimate content, in the form of text or sound on the internet or social media. As Scottish Women's Aid stated, by specifying photographs and films, this excludes the sharing of private and intimate written and audio communications. The exposure of the threat of sharing these has the same outcome. It is designed to humiliate and control the victim. Sometimes text and images can be sent at the same time. Would we criminalise the image but not the abusive and threatening text? For example, the sharing of an intimate image on Facebook without consent would, under this bill, be a prosecutable offence. However, if someone was to share an intimate conversation or a screenshot of an intimate conversation, this wouldn't be covered. I would argue that the sharing of this type of content could have the same effect as sharing intimate images without consent. This could cause just as much fear, alarm or distress to the victim and arguably would be designed to do so. Amendment 70 is a technical amendment that updates the bill to reflect expanding the definition. In effect, Amendment 70 removes a disclosure or threats to disclose a photograph or film which shows or appears to show another person be in an intimate situation and replaces it with a reference to an item mentioned in subsection 1A, Amendment 73. 
that involves another person in a way mentioned in that subsection. Amendments 72, 74, 75, 76, 77, 78 and 79 are all technical amendments that replaces references to photograph and film throughout the bill to item. What we mean by item is defined in Amendment 73. Amendment 80 is a further technical technical amendment which adds a reference to the new subsection 1AA which was created by amendment 73. Amendments 81 is again a technical amendment adding further reference to the new subsection 1A created in amendment 73. Finally amendment 82 clarifies what we mean by intimate in terms of conversation messages or communications. <coughs> it needs to con include references to an act which is considered sexual or content, content which takes as a whole is considered to be of a sexual nature. Further to this, the content must not have been expected to be distributed or that there was an understanding that it would have been kept private. These amendments are supported by Women's Aid Scotland and Victim Support. Police Scotland also gave evidence to the committee in support of including written and audio communication of this type. And they went on and they said that take cognizance that should, the offence should take cognizance of all forms of communication and distribution. While I understand the sending of abusive messages is a criminal offence, the same doesn't always apply to the sharing of intimate material. So these amendments ensure that the sharing of an intimate material without permission is covered under one bill. This cuts down on repetition and leads to a more streamlined and easier system. It also means all offences are dealt with in the same manner. Currently, under the Communications Act 2003, Section 127, it's not, appropriate, uh, it's not an appropriate offence for dealing with this behaviour as, firstly, it sets a very high threshold of the content of the message or other matter being grossly offensive or of an indecent, obscene or menacing character. Unlike the proposed offence in the Abusive Behaviour and Sexual Harm Bill, the offence under Section 127 of the 2003 Act can only be tried under summary procedure, not solemn, which limits the overall custodial and financial penalties since the proposals allow for offences under this section to be tried under either summary or solemn procedure. Further, the maximum term of imprisonment under the summary procedure in section 127 is limited to six months, as opposed to the 12 months in this bill, meaning that women or men who are abused by having private written and audio <coughs> communications shared without their consent would have a lesser protection and perpetrators may well tailor their behaviour to accommodate this gap in the law. Um, with the advances in technology making it easier to distribute information with or without consent, it is vital that the law keeps up to ensure those who wish to cause harm are dealt with appropriately, appropriately and consistently by the justice system. And I ask the committee and the Cabinet Secretary to support my amendments. Thank you very much. Thank you. John, do you want to come in here? <coughs> yeah, thank you. Rod. Convener, I, I have to say I, I've, I've changed my position on this matter. I think this, the, this section of the bill, the intention of it is, is very clear. Um, now, uh, Margaret talked about um, those with criminal intent tailoring their, their conduct. I, I think whether the term displacement might be more appropriate here too. Um, I, I, I am concerned that it's not future-proofed, if you like. Uh, I think the support of women's aid is, is important, important. I think the comments of the police are also important. And for all of these reasons, I support the uh, expansion of this particular disclosure section and all these other amendments that go with it. Um, thank you, I've recognised that there are obviously uh, differences of opinion from various groups about that, this question, whether it should be extended. Um, I take on board um, the point that's been made about <coughs> Section 127 of the 2003 Act, but it still provides a punishment, and it's also, uh, we all should, should bear in mind, Section 38 of the Criminal um, Justice and Licensing Scotland Act 2010, which criminalises uh, behaviour 
which causes fear and alarm, although it doesn't extend as far as distress, as Professor Chalmers said. So we have alternative ways of dealing with these issues, which we shouldn't forget. Um, I'm really still on the side of, uh, of the academics, on the side of Professor McGlynn, who would not recommend that the law uh, covers text. Uh, and we did put a big section in our report about unintended consequences, and I think those issues are still relevant. Uh, and I, for the moment, would uh, oppose this amendment. Cabinet Secretary. Oh, beg your pardon. Uh, sorry, Alison. Beg your pardon. Uh, I wouldn't say very much because I don't have much voice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I would suggest that we proceed cautiously on, on, on this one, and I agree with what Roddy has said. And I don't support the group of amendments. <clears throat> I get inflicted with that occasionally. <laughs> and the Cabinet Secretary is smiling in agreement at that comment, which is not a good thing <laughs> no. to do. Cabinet <laughs> Secretary. Um, <laughs> Uh, amendment 70 and 72 to 82 would expand the scope of the intimate images offence at section 2 to cover intimate sound recordings and written communications. Uh, as I set out uh, in the Scottish Government's response to the committee stage 1 report, we took a decision to restrict the offence to the sharing of intimate images as almost all of the cases which we are aware of have involved the sharing of images. Unfortunately, we're all too aware that there are far too many websites set up specifically to enable people to post intimate photographs or films of their partners or ex-partners. I'm not aware of similar such websites where uh, people post voice messages or emails written by or to their partner or ex-partner. The sharing of images, uh, which may enable uh, a complete stranger to identify the victim, is, in our view, a betrayal of trust and a breach of privacy, which is especially likely to cause distress. That is, of course, part of the justification for the new offence. It is worth remembering uh, that it will remain possible for prosecutions to prosecutors to use existing laws in relation to the sharing of written and recorded material by using, for example, the Communications Act 2003 offence or the offences of threatening or abusive behaviour in appropriate cases. The Committee Stage 1 report noted that a majority of the Committee supported restricting the scope of the offence to photographs and films and that the Committee was mindful of the risk of unintended co consequences if the Bill takes too wide an approach in this area. With regards to the question of unintended consequences, <coughs> I note that these amendments apply not only to intimate recordings uh, written or spoken by the victim, but also those directed to or left for the victim. Consequently, one perverse effect of this is that a person could face criminal liability for publishing or disclosing a communication that they themselves had written or a voicemail message that they had left. More generally, while it's hard to envisage circumstances in which someone would have legitimate reason to share intimate photographs or films of their partner or ex-partner uh, with a third party without their consent, consent, it is easier to imagine circumstances in which they might wish to share a written message or voice message with a friend. They may, uh, for example, be confused or even fearful as a result of what they might consider to be the disturbing sexual content of a message sent to them and wish to seek advice about what to do about it. They could be criminally liable, criminal liable if these amendments were agreed. It may be helpful if I give the committee an example of how this could apply. It's our understanding of Margaret McDougall's amendments and how they would operate in a way in which they could criminalise in the following situation. Two 13-year-olds uh, uh, exchange, exchange messages about a celebrity. In the course of these exchanges, one of the teenagers indicates they fancy the celebrity and would like to have sexual relations with them. The other teenager decides to share the text with other people in their class at school. In that situation, a communication has taken place which a reasonable person would consider to be sexual in nature and a reasonable person would expect to be kept private. So the person sharing that text has committed a criminal offence if it can be shown that they were reckless as to whether the sharing of the message would cause the person 
at the other person fear, alarm or distress. Well, it is, of course, most probably embarrassing and distressing for the person whose message has been shared. Our view is that the person who has shared the message should not be committing a criminal offence. It is our understanding that Margaret McDougall's amendments would criminalise such behaviour. As we said in our response to the Committee Stage 1 report, we are happy to monitor this issue as the offence is implemented to assess whether there is a need to reconsider the scope of the offence in the future. However, we consider the scope of the offence contained in the Bill takes the right approach and therefore we would ask members not to support Amendment 70 and 72 to 82 in the name of Margaret McDougall. Thank you very much. Margaret, please to wind up and then press her withdrawal. Thank you, Convener. Um, you know, I understand that the above amendment may introduce unintended con consequences, but you have to um, show criminal intent to actually break the law and, and then be found guilty uh, of or charged with a criminal a crime. So, however, the way that um, the bill would be written and outlined, in, that it would be still in line with the aims of the bill. I just think that the, it should still be included because of these reasons. Um, you gave the example of two 13-year-olds. And uh, when Tam Bailey, the Children's Commissioner, gave us uh, evidence, he said that young people shouldn't be exempt from the bill, uh, you know, because young people are uh, it's taken into account they go to the children's panel uh, you know and so that would be dealt with under that a uh, legal aspect so i would um, ask the minister if he's not inclined to accept my amendments today would he be happy to work with me to ensure that the expanded definition in some form is present within the bill because if this aspect isn't in the bill, then it leaves the system open for abuse, as too many loopholes exist in to circumvent photograph and film. If the Communications Act 2003 Act offence exists and has been used without any issue of unintended consequences, then the Scottish offence is perfectly capable, capable of being defined in similar terms to meet the lack of suitable penalties under the 2003 Act. And I move the... Well, moved it. I'm going to let, because you've moved it, and we're going, you've asked the Cabinet Secretary to respond, I'll ask the Cabinet Secretary right. to respond okay. to you, Margaret. Uh, thank you, Convener. The first thing I should say is that uh, recklessness is not the same as intent. Um, it's a less onerous test in these matters. I, I'm, of course, always willing to discuss matters with members, but I think I have set out uh, the uh, potential unintended consequences of going down the route of expanding this offence uh, any wider. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not minded to do so, but I'm, uh, of course, more than happy to discuss that matter with the member if she uh, chooses to do so uh, prior to stage three. But that doesn't give a commitment to us uh, looking at extending the scope of the offence. Decision time, Margaret, to... I know what the press or withdraw. says, I will press. You press. Amendment. Right, the question is, Amendment 70 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There'll be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. That's three in favour and six against. That amendment is not agreed to. I call Amendment 71 in the name of Margaret Mitchell and a group on its own. Margaret, to move and speak to your amendment. Thank you, Convener. <clears throat> Section 2 of the Bill creates a new offence of disclosing or threatening to disclose an intimate photograph or film. Section 2.1 provides that a person commits an offence if, among other situations, the person intends to cause fear, alarm or distress in doing so or is reckless as to causing fear, alarm or distress. Again, this is lodged on behalf of the Law Society of Scotland and is again a probing amendment which would limit the offence to being proved where it intended to cause fear, alarm or distress to be, as opposed to having been reckless as to whether B would suffer fear, alarm or distress as a result of the disclosure or threatening to disclose an intimate photograph or film. 
During stage one evidence, both the Faculty of Advocates and the Law Society expressed concern about the inclusion of recklessness within the mens rea of this particular offence. The faculty provided the example of a person who comes home to find his flatmate asleep on the sofa wearing only his boxer shorts and takes a picture of his flatmate finding it amusing. He had no intent to cause fear, alarm or distress, but was reckless in doing so. The faculty pointed out that if he shows that, the picture, if he shows that picture to someone else, he is guilty of an offence and the bill provides no defence to that scenario. Similarly, the Law Society suggested that reckless, recklessness is too wide and there should be intention to cause harm or humiliation rather than recklessness. Again, I would welcome the Cabinet Secretary's comments, especially in view of the comments he's just made to Margaret McDougall um, about the unintended consequences of um, including an intimate voice um, recording, a voice recording or a written communication. I move the Amendment 71 in my name. Which, Elaine, do you want to? Yeah, I, again, I oppose these, this amendment for many of the reasons I opposed uh, Amendment 69, but equally, I, as I said at the Stage 1 uh, uh, debate, I have no sympathy for that flatmate that goes in and takes a picture of their flatmate in, boxer sh in his boxer shorts and posts it around the world. I think that's completely unacceptable. and I, I couldn't see why that is any sort of defence. <laughs> oh, we're moving. Right. Boxer shorts are <laughs> featuring highly in today's conversation. I hope we're not going to have other... I know we're going to have more of this. Worse. Rod, please, and then Gil. Um, yeah, thank you, convener. Perhaps I should uh, refer to my list of interest. <laughs> your, box, your boxer shorts for a moment. No. <laughs> Yes, you're, yes, I beg your pardon. That's too that much, silly of too much yes, information, Convener. Um, refer to my register of interest as a member of the Faculty of Advocates. Yeah, no, obviously I take a contrary view to the view of Mr Meehan and just wanted to remind uh, people of the comments of uh, Catherine Dyer of the Crown Office in terms of the impact on the victim uh, if uh, really being yeah. the important test that people do not see themselves as victims unless something has happened to them. And it's in that situation, it's hard to see that they would see themselves as a victim. Thank you very much. I apologise, though, for my frivolity. I must take my pills. Gil. Yeah, I, I do like <coughs> comments. It's, it's the, what happens to the victim here rather than the, who perpetrates it that I'm in uh, clear side of. Thank you very much. Cabinet Secretary. Amendment 71 relates to the intimate images offence in section 2 of the bill. Uh, the bill currently provides that where a person discloses or threatens to disclose an intimate image of another person, it is sufficient that they were reckless as to whether they would cause the person featured in the image fear, alarm or distress for the offence to be committed. Yeah, Amendment 71 would restrict the circumstances in which the offence could be committed to where it is proven that the accused intended to cause the person featured in the image to suffer fear, alarm or distress. We have taken uh, the approach we have in the bill uh, because we consider that it should, be, should not be open to the accused to escape criminal liability because though they might have been well aware that the disclosure of an intimate image would cause the person appearing in it to suffer fear, alarm and distress, uh, that was not their intention and they instead disclosed the image for say financial gain or for a joke or to show off to their friends. It, it, we consider it appropriate that the offence is committed in circumstances where it is a foreseeable consequence of someone's decision to disclose or threaten to disclose an intimate image that they would cause the person appearing in the image to suffer fear, alarm or distress. Uh, that is what the bill provides uh, by, make, by having recklessness as well as intent as the main rear of the offence. Uh, we do not consider it should be open to offenders to uh, argue that they are not guilty of the offence because though they were reckless uh, uh, as to whether in disclosing an intimate image they might cause a person to suffer fear, uh, alarm and distress, it can't be proven uh, that that was their intention. And I would invite members to oppose Amendment 71. Thank you. Margaret, please to wind up. Uh, thank you, Convener. 
Uh, clearly, a balance has to be struck, and I think today's discussion has been useful in highlighting the issue and teasing out the intention behind the inclusion of recklessness here in terms of not only the impact on the victim, but I, I think it also sends out a powerful warning um, to individuals posting images that they must always stop and think about the potential consequences of doing so, whether they are untended or otherwise. So with that in mind, convener, I seek leave to withdraw. withdraw. Agreed. You agreed. Committee's yeah. agreed. Yeah. I call on amendment 72 in the name of Margaret McDougall. Ready to debate with amendment 70. Move or not move, Margaret? No. You're moving it. The question is amendment 72 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. There'll be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. Three in favour, six against. That amendment is not agreed to. Call amendment 73 in the name of Mark McDougall. Ready to wait for amendment 70. Move or not move? Move. The question is uh, that amendment 73 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. There'll be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. That's three, four, six against. That amendment is not agreed to. Call amendment 74 in the name of Mark McDougall. Ready to wait for amendment 70. Move or not move? move. The question is amendment 74 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? <coughs> We're not agreed. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. Uh, that's uh, three in favour, six against. I just remind members these are technical amendments and, and the member may wish to consider, however, uh, but I just leave it at that. Call amendment 75, the name of... Uh, no. I call amendment 75. <laughs> it's, I've, I've said they're technical amendments. It's up to the member with the amendments. They're competent. Of course it's competent, but um, we, it's up to the member to consider. Call amendment 75 in the name of Margaret McDougall. Ready be amendment 70. Move or not move? I'll move. Those in favour of um, it's, uh, amendment 75, please show. Those against, please show. That's three in favour, six against. That amendment is not agreed to. Call amendment 76 in the name of Mark McDougall. Ready to debate with amendment 70. Move or not move? Move. The question is amendment 76 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed, I think. Just, could you just say, because it would, I know we're all going to go the same route, but those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. That's three in favour. Put my hand up. Put my hand up. That's three in favour, six against. That amendment is not agreed to. Call amendment 77 in the name of Mark McDougall. Ready to make amendment 70. Move or not move? Move. The question is amendment 77 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. That's three in favour, six against. That amendment is not agreed to. Call amendment 78 in the name of Mark McDougall. Move. Have I, have I gone too fast? Yeah. I'm correct. Yeah. It's moved. Uh, the, the question is Amendment 78 be agreed to. Are we agreed? No. We're not agreed. Those in favour, please show. There's a division. To put your, if you're oh. going to be in favour, you'll need to show it. Yeah. Three in favour. Those against, please show. That's three, four, six against. That amendment is not agreed. Called Amendment 79. They weren't with you already debated. Move. Margaret, move or not move? Move. The question is <coughs> Amendment 79 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. Three in favour, six against. That amendment is not agreed to. <coughs> Call amendment. Am I 80 now? 80 in the name of Mark McDougall. Ready to debate amendment 70. Move or not move? Move. The question is <coughs> amendment 80 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. Three in favour, six against. That amendment is not agreed to. Call Amendment 4 in the name of Elaine Murray and a group on its own. Elaine Murray, please to move and speak to that amendment. Right. Uh, thank you, uh, Convener. Uh, one of my colleagues was contacted uh, on behalf of Professors Claire McGlynn and Erica Rackley, Professors of Law at Durham University and the University of Birmingham, in connection with this bill to which they had already submitted written evidence. They welcomed the proposal to introduce a new offence criminalising the disclosure of an intimate photograph or film. Not only do, do such actions constitute a fundamental breach of privacy, dignity and sexual autonomy and a serious form of harassment and abuse but also a form of cultural harm impacting not only on the individuals involved but also on society as a whole. However, the professors also consider that the bill, as it stands, does not make appropriate provision for the distribution of private sexual images non-consensually taken in a public place, including, but not limited to, images of so-called upskirting. 
as currently drafted and in response to concerns to exclude images of streakers or naked ramblers, distribu distribution of such images as a, a criminal offence is excluded. While recognising that the taking of such images is prohibited under the Sexual Offences Scotland Act 2009, there is no pr uh, provision to prevent their distribution and of course uh, the images may be distributed by another individual. The bill should cover the distribution of so-called upskirt or down blouse images and related images. These images often end up on websites dedicated to the sharing of non-consensually taken private sexual photographs and or pornographic websites. These businesses I understand are big business. One such site was exposed by the Mail on Sunday in May 2015 and was said to be receiving 70,000 views a day and valued at £130 million. The Professor's recommendation is that the omission could be easily rectified by means of a defence of voluntary disclosure. This would prevent the criminalisation of images where the subject has voluntarily disclosed themselves, as in the case of a streaker. In addition, the Sexual Offences Scotland Act 2009 and Section 94B provides that an offence is committed where A records an image be beneath B's clothing of B's genital or buttocks, whether exposed or co covered by underwear, in circumstances where the buttocks, genitals or underwear would not otherwise be visible. However, this bill also includes breasts, and apparently in an addition to, as I said, to upskirting, there are also down-blousing websites where women, pictures of women's breasts are exposed. In order to cover both the distribution of intimate phot phot photographs taken without consent in a public place and to include the wider definition of an intimate situation, I consider that the bill should be amended. And this is just a small amendment which would help to include this. Now, if the wording suggested by the legislation team and modified by Professor Rackley could be improved, I would be happy to work with the government on the amendments at stage three. But I do hope that I can have the agreement of the committee on the need for such an amendment. Uh, and I apologise for again having to discuss such unsavoury practices uh, in public. And I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much. Any other members wishing to speak? Roddy, please. Uh, just briefly, I, I understand uh, where Elaine is coming from, but my instinct is that if we were going to deal with this issue, it would be by a further amendment to the voyeurism offence under the Sexual Offences 2009 Act. There speaks an advocate for us, I mean, referring us to other legislation, which is useful. Cabinet Secretary. A convener amendment four relates to uh, one of the defences uh, to the intimate images offence. The defence at sa section 25 of the bill currently operates so that where the image or film shared uh, was taken in a public place where members of the public were present, there is a defence that means the accused uh, will not be convicted. Uh, this is to avoid the situation where, say, uh, someone shares without consent a film or image of someone streaking at a sporting event uh, and a criminal complaint is made to the police. In that situation, we do not think a criminal offence should have been committed. Uh, what Amendment 4 seeks to do is to restrict the defence to circumstances where the person in the film or image consented to being in that intimate situation. The effect of Amendment 4 uh, would be that the public place defence is only available where the subject of the film or photograph consented to being in an intimate situation in a public place. Uh, this could be, for example, a person who deliberately chooses to streak at a sporting event or a person uh, at a naturalist uh, uh, resort. Uh, the defence uh, would not be available where a person distributes an image showing, for example, a subject of a photograph or film who has been stripped against their will or sexually assaulted in a public place. Uh, we understand and sympathise with uh, what would appear to lie behind Amendment 4. Uh, we note that the defence uh, would continue to apply where, for example, someone takes a photograph of a naked protester in a public place, uh, but where someone had not consented to being in an intimate situation, for example, because they had been forcibly undressed in a public place, a person distributing the photograph or film could not avoid uh, conviction simply because it was taken in a public place. However, we think the exact wording of the amendment does not quite achieve what we consider to be the intended effect. 
in particular. Uh, we think someone who is exposed in a public place cannot be said to always have consented to be an intimate situation as that applies uh, implies someone else is always involved in their being uh, in their being in an intimate situation. Instead, it, we think it would be more accurate to say that on that occasion they choose it to be in an intimate situation. So we do not think uh, the amendment is worded correctly at present. Uh, the member uh, has said that the amendment is intended to ensure that so-called upskirting or downblouse uh, photographs taken in public places are covered by the offence. However, it's not clear to us that the amendment achieves this as it's not clear that people photographed in such situations are in an intimate situation, as defined at section 3.1 of the bill. In such cases, the person taking the photograph or film has operated equipment in such a way as to record an image of a person's genitals, buttocks or breasts in circumstances where they would not otherwise be visible. Therefore, it's not clear that there was any exposure on the part of the person being recorded, either consensual or otherwise. It's for uh, this reason that our response to the Stage 1 report, uh, in our response to the Stage 1 report, I said that if the distribution of voyeuristic upskirting images were to be made an offence, this would be best achieved by building on the voyeurism offence contained within the Sexual Offences Scotland Act 2019. In addition, uh, we would welcome uh, time to con fully consider the impact of restricting the defence uh, to make sure that there are no unintended consequences that would allow perpetrators to evade justice. In light of this, I'd be happy uh, to work with Elaine Murray ahead of Stage 3 to see if a workable amendment can be developed to address issues that she's highlighted and would on that basis ask the member not to move Amendment 4. Well, she's moved it, so she's yeah, got to yeah. decide whether yeah. she's going to press or withdraw. Would you wind up first, please, um, Well, uh, I, I won't take a m more time in, in winding up. I'm uh, pleased that the Cabinet Secretary has indicated his willingness to try to find a solution to this uh, issue, which I think is, is important and is serious, and the idea that young women, or indeed young men, or women or many of, uh, men of any age, uh, can be intruded upon in this way, yeah. uh, and, and materials... The money made out of putting material onto websites is, is abhorrent, uh, and I will withdraw the amendment uh, and look forward to working with. with yes, uh, sorry, uh, and look forward to working with right. the cabinet secretary. We're agreed that that amendment's withdrawn. The questions at section two be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. Call amendment eight one. The name of Margaret McDougall. Ready to debate amendment. Simply Margaret, move or not move. Move. The question is amendment eight one. Be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Those in favour, please show. Those. Those in favour, please show. What, sorry. <laughs> sorry, yes, <laughs> it's a bit informal in here at times, Cabinet Secretary. Those in favour, please show. Okay, right. right. Those against, please show. That's three in favour, six against. That amendment is not agreed. To call Amendment 82 in the name of Mark, we do already with Amendment 7. Margaret, move or not move? Move. <laughs> the question is, Amendment 82 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No, no. We're not agreed. There'll be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. Thank you very much. That's three in favour, six against. That amendment is not agreed to. The questions at section three be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The questions at section four be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Call amendment five in the name of the Cabinet Secretary Group with amendments six and seven. Cabinet Secretary, please move amendment five and speak to the other amendments in the group. Amendment 5, 6 and 7 are minor amendments to ensure that Schedule 1 to the Bill does what it intends to do and to ensure that the wording is consistent. Schedule 1 makes provision in relation to e-commerce directive, uh, which requires the liability of information society providers in respect of Section 2 intimate images offences to be limited in certain ways. Amendment 5 and 6 adjust the wording of the provisions at paragraph 2 and 3 of the schedule, uh, which set out exceptions to the offences for internet service providers where they are catching or hosting information. Uh, to ensure uh, consistency with paragraph 1 of the schedule, uh, which sets out the exceptions for internet providers, uh, acting as mere uh, conduits. Amendment 5 and 6 adjust the wording of these paragraphs to refer to the circumstances in which a service provider is not capable of 
being guilty of an offence. Amendment 7 concerns the exception to the offence for internet service providers which are hosting information on their servers on the basis that they have no actual knowledge of illegal activity on their server. The amendment is to ensure that the exceptions apply in the right circumstances. The exceptions it should apply if the service provider has uh, no actual knowledge that an offence was committed under Section 2 of the Bill. The amendment also has the effect of simplifying the drafting in paragraph uh, 2, 3, and I move Amendment 5. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Any other members wish to speak? I take it, Cabinet Secretary, you don't need to wind up. The question is Amendment 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yep. Call Amendment 6 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. We are ready to debate Amendment 5. Minister, to move formally. Moved. The question is Amendment 6 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yep. Call Amendment 7 the Cabinet Secretary already debated. Cab Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is Amendment 7 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is that Schedule 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. Call Amendment 67 in the name of Alison McInnes Group with Amendment 68. Alison, please to move that Amendment 67 and speak to both amendments in the group. Thank you very much, Convener. I hope these are un uncontroversial um, amendments. My Amendment 67 introduces a requirement for the Scottish Ministers to carry out a public information and education campaign in connection with the new offence set out in Section 2 of the Bill. Members might know that in England and Wales, where a similar offence has been introduced, the Ministry of Justice is already running the Revenge Porn Be Aware Before You Share campaign, and that includes a Facebook campaign page, a Twitter hashtag, a Revenge Porn Helpline to support victims, and other promotional material. With modern technology becoming more part of our lives, this is something that we need to replicate to ensure that as many people as possible are aware of the new offence, not just potential victims, but also <laughs> potential perpetrators, because the idea is to reduce the instances covered by this new, <coughs> new offence. Um, in the written submission, Zero Tolerance outlined why a public awareness campaign is important. Similarly, my Amendment 68 seeks to amend the current guidance on relationships, sexual health and parenthood education in schools for the same aims that I have already discussed. And Bernardo's and the National Organisation for the Treatment of Abusers have called for this too. I do hope that the committee are able to support my amendments. Thank you. Could you and, move uh, sorry, I move Thank you very much. Um, Margaret Mitchell, please. I'd be very supportive of these amendments, especially with the inclusion of recklessness in Section 2. Yes, I'm also... Uh, supportive of the amendments. I think actually an important part of what might be achieved by this bill is actually getting the message out there about the sort of behaviour being unacceptable. And I also think it's important that in uh, education in schools around sexual health and relationships that the, the message is given out about consent and about respect. And I think that those are very fundamental parts of what you know what we used to call sex education is actually a, a broader sort of sense now. And it, it's important that this this bill is accompanied by that education, not of the general public and of uh, particularly in schools. Uh, well, I'd have to say I'm, I'm sympathetic, but I beg your, oh, beg your pardon. Thank you, convener. I, I just wanted, to, yeah, yeah, just wanted to say very brief, briefly that um, I f fully understand where uh, Alison's amendment is coming from. And obviously, there's a clear need to raise public awareness of this issue, and obviously to look at kind of. Uh, issues in terms of uh, education and sexual health. My query is whether we need to put this in the legislation or whether we can rely on uh, kind of the government's general commitment to, to raise awareness of this issue. And obviously I'll be keen you to hear from took the words out of my mouth. I, I think yeah, I'm very sure. sympathetic. I'm coming in now anyway <coughs> uh, because I just want to. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, so I'm very sympathetic, but I really don't think it's appropriate to perhaps put this in legislation. Um, you know, government should publicise changes in the law by various, and particularly when creating something that wasn't an offence before. So my only objection is I don't think it's appropriate in primary legislation. Over to you, Christian. More worry that uh, I want to share about maybe telling youngsters that this website exists and you know this revenge port website shouldn't get any advertisement from anybody. So I've, I've got a little worried about that. Right, Cabinet Secretary, please. Uh, Amendment 67 places a duty on Scottish ministers to carry out a public information and education campaign uh, when the intimate images offence is commenced. I can confirm to committee that the Scottish Government will take appropriate steps to promote public awareness of Section 2 and its coming into force. 
As it is our intent to ensure public awareness is raised prior to the implementation of the offence, Amendment 67 is unnecessary to achieve what Alison McInnes is seeking. In addition, this type of issue is not something that normally would be included as a requirement in legislation. Uh, the statute book would become a bit uh, crowded if we had a provision about publicity in relation to every new offence or policy uh, that was put into law. Finally, we consider Amendment uh, 67 uh, focuses entirely on the method of seeking to raise awareness, i.e. a requirement for a publicity and education campaign rather than actually on requiring to raise awareness, which we presume would be Alison McInnes's intent, and we therefore consider uh, this is an amendment which is technically deficient in its wording. In, on the basis uh, of uh, that commitment I have made uh, to the member, I would ask her to withdraw Amendment 67. Um, amendment 68 places a duty on Scottish ministers to update guidance on relationships, sexual health and parenthood education in schools to provide guidance on how issues relating to the intimate images offence are to be covered in such education. It might be helpful if I explain to the committee that relationship, sexual health and parenthood education is a recognised subject within the health and wellbeing section of Curriculum for Excellence. In December 2014, the Scottish Government published guidance for schools in relationship, sexual health and parenthood education. This guidance notes that education must take account of developments in online communications and ensure that children are informed of the law in Scotland on communications involving sexual content. Uh, this currently includes, for example, offences concerning indecent communication in the Sexual Offences Scotland Act 2009 and offences concerning the possession and distribution of indecent images of children. When the intimate images offence comes into force, it will become part of the law of Scotland and as such, the existing guidance already sets out what relationships, sexual health and parenthood education will cover uh, the intimate images offence. While I can understand the amendment has, uh, why the amendment has been lodged, on the basis of the explanation I've given and the commitment I've given to uh, the work we've undertaken in order to publicise the new offence, uh, I would invite the member to withdraw her amendment 68 as it's unnecessary in order to achieve this policy aim. Some things to wind up. Thank you very much. <coughs> I'm grateful for the Cabinet Secretary's reassurances that he's just given, um, and I'm happy to accept those. Um, I'm particularly heartened that he, he's talking about um, moving to a public uh, campaign in advance of the legislation uh, coming into force. And heaven forbid that I should put forward an amendment that's been found deficient. So I will withdraw <laughs> at Amendment 67. <laughs> we, we wish to withdraw. So yeah. Committee agreed. agreed. Thank you very much. Call Amendment 68, name of Alice McInnes, already debate for Amendment 67. Move or not move? Not move. The questions to Section 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? I call Amendment 1 in the name of Margaret Mitchell Group with Amendment 2. Margaret, please, to move that amendment and speak to both amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Amendment 1 removes Section 6 of the Bill, which sets a precedent by introducing statutory jury directions. Amendment 2 is consequential. The Section 6 statutory duty direction applies in a trial on indictment for a sexual offence where the evidence has been led that the complainer did not tell or delayed in telling anyone about the offence and or did not report or delayed in reporting the offence to an investigation, investigating agency, for instance the police, and or where evidence is led suggesting that the sexual activity took place without physical resistance by the complainer, uh, then um, a question is asked or a, statue, uh, a statement is made with a view to listing or drawing attention to the evidence of that nature. The Scottish Government has insisted that the introduction of statutory duty directions would be sufficiently flexible for judges to give appropriate decisions. In reality, it strikes down one of the central tenets of Scots law, namely the independence of the judiciary and the separation of powers. Others have described it as a worrying example of constitutional creep. These concerns are shared by the legal profession and 
The Law Society states that the move represents a major departure from existing practice where the distinct roles of a judge and jury are clear. And Lord Carlaway ar argues that the bill sets a precedent. If Parliament dictates what should be said to juries by a judge in this area, other people will no doubt, uh, no doubt seek to extend that to other areas and will wish other directions to be given. And that is where we get into the constitutional divide. And both the Law Society and the Faculty of Advocates have argued that the Scottish Government has not made a sufficiently strong evidential case that in the circumstances that the directions have been tailored for, juries acquit for the wrong reasons. This dangerous precedent is being set despite the fact that, as I said in the Stage 1 debate, the issues that the statutory jury directions seek to address can be adequately dealt with, with by way and by use of expert witnesses. The only reason expert witnesses are not being used relates to cost implications, a fact acknowledged by both Catherine Dyer, the, the CEO of the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service, and Lord Carlaway as the then Lord Justice Clark. Furthermore, given that the Scottish Government is in the process of undertaking jury research, there is a strong case for waiting for the results of this research. This would provide important evidence about how juries reach decisions and whether these misconceptions exist. I ask therefore the Scottish Government to think again about interfering with judicial independence and urge it to remove these provisions from the bill. I move the amendment in my name. Um, well, I'm going to come in now because I support uh, um, and formally support this amendment, um, which shows we're very flexible in this committee. Uh, but my concern is a serious concern because I, I, I fully support the arguments put by Margaret Mitchell, indeed by Lord Carloway and by um, Sheriff Little. It's a serious matter of legislators telling a judge what directions he must, with a little exception, give to a jury. And to me, it crosses a line. Um, we have a very clear division between legislators and those who implement the law, and that's important to maintain. And both Lord Carloway and Sheriff Little made the point that this is a constitutional, there's a constitutional issue here. Uh, when answering uh, my colleague John Finney, who was asking about, you know, if this came into practice, what the position would be, and he says, well, we're all members of, this is Lord Carloway, we're all members of a democracy and we respect Parliament's legislative function. We do not get upset in the way suggested. Parliament wants to tell judges to give the jury the direction proposing the bill we'll give them. However, he goes on to say, we have stated that it's traditionally the role of the judge rather than Parliament to decide on jury directions. That is the way it has been in the division of constitutional responsibilities, but that takes us only so far. In any jurisdiction in the Commonwealth, it is very rare for a Parliament to dictate to judges what they should say in jury directions, or it has been done in a couple of jurisdictions. If you want us to say something specific in jury directions, we will do so. However, we are just saying that what is proposed is not necessarily the best way of doing that. Now, there's a heavy opinion here from the Lord President. And from uh, Sheriff Liddell, it says, again, if I go back, sorry, to Lord Carloway, an uh, issue raised by Margaret Mitchell, well, it sets a precedent if Parliament dictates what should be said to juries by a judge in this area, other people will no doubt seek to extend that to other areas and will wish other directions to be given. And that is where we get into the constitutional divide. It's a line being crossed, in my view, that must not be crossed. And the same thing, point is made by Sheriff Little. There are other issues about the practicalities and how effective it will be, and that, that might, you know, at the end of the day, it will be ineffective anyway if it goes through. And I know there's not a majority on this committee in favour of Margaret Mitchell's position or mine, but that doesn't matter a whit to me. What matters to me is that we are crossing this very important constitutional line in telling a judge in statute 
what must be said to a jury, something that has not been done before. And again, even the thin end of the wedge argument, you do it once, you may be doing it again, somebody will use this as a precedent. So for that reason, I fully support that. And of course, the other um, amendment is simply uh, in the long title is consequential uh, to this amendment. And I'll call the other members, Elaine, and then Christian, and Rod, please. Thank you, convener. I'm afraid I don't agree with my friends on either side on this uh, issue. Uh, we know that the public have misconceptions about the way in which rape victims uh, behave after rape, and they, uh, often they have misconceptions about the degree, of, for example, of physical resistance or the, the speed at which somebody would report the fact that they've been raped. Now, juries are made up of members of the public, and members of juries may also have misconceptions uh, about the reactions of people who have been raped. Now, we know that it is difficult for rape uh, uh, cases to come to court uh, because of a whole number of reasons around corroboration. I'm not going to go into that debate again, but there are a number of reasons uh, why it is difficult for rape victims to get their cases in, into court. We know that, for example, 15%, the highest percentage of not proven vict uh, verdicts actually are uh, uh, given on rape uh, cases. Uh, and I think it is necessary for uh, uh, this type of activity from, for the judge to be able to put, put right uh, any misconceptions that a jury may have, uh, which could prevent a victim of rape from getting the justice that they deserve. Now, I hear there's an argument about other areas, but this is a specific instance where, ju where judges must give ju uh, judicial directions. In order to extend that to any other area, that would have to be in legislation. Therefore, I don't see that it's suddenly going to creep, uh, as it was said, uh, into all sorts of other uh, parts of legislation. It would have to be introduced by uh, specific primary, primary legislation for that to happen. So I'm afraid I'm going to oppose both amendments one and two. Christian. Not for the first time, Governor, I will agree with Ellen Murray, because the area is uh, area around sexual offences, and sexual offences which uh, cover, unfortunately, where the victim is more likely uh, to be of a specific gender. And I think, uh, you know, Ellen Murray talked about misconception, the, the, uh, uh, the notes that we get, the supplementary notes that we got from the uh, attached to this bill, uh, talk about a certain ill-founded preconception held by the member of the public, and that's very important to, to see it, this ill-founded uh, preconception. And uh, as, as far as we've got this ill-founded uh, uh, preconception held by member of the public, it should be in legislation. And, and I do agree that it should be in legislation at the jury directions, because it has to be done in a non-adversary manner, making sure that uh, we've got a way uh, to, uh, to rebalance uh, what society are thinking today. And if in the future uh, society hasn't got this, pre this ill-founded preconception, I would be happy to, to have it re removed from, from legislation. But uh, as far as we are, where we are just now, true directions are the answer. Well, um, thank you, convener. Um, I un unfortunately take a different view to the view uh, of Margaret Mitchell and yourself on this matter. I accept that, that uh, this uh, particular uh, um, part of the bill does not meet with the favour of the, what I might describe as the legal establishment. I think the key points to remember is that these directions will only be given where appropriate, where there is an issue in, in the case either in, in relation to delay or the absence of physical resistance. And there's also a safeguard position with that, uh, <laughs> where the judge feels that no reasonable jury could rely on the evidence, then, then no direction will need to be given. Um, yes, it sets a precedent. Yes, we don't have jury research, but because of the difficulties of the Contempt of Court Act, that's just a fact which we're obviously ad addressing in the future in, in relation to the jury research that uh, Lord Bonamy is undertaking. Um, but I think it's well established from other things that the juries have preconceptions. This is a matter that's been flagged up for a while, and I think we need to bite the bullet and, uh, uh, and pass uh, the bill with this part of the bill in it. Thank you, Governor. Well, uh, the term tradition has been used a few times, and the tradition we have in Scots law is a very fine tradition of an embarrassingly low level of convictions for heinous crimes. And I place great store on the, the, the store on the rights of accused, and I don't doubt that defence will tailor their comments to uh, reflect um, any um, charge to the jury from the, the um, judges. Um, if Lord Calloway said that's not the best way of doing it, then. Um, there's been plenty of opportunities for the judiciary to come forward with suggestions of better ways of, of improving um, the situation there. And for those reasons, I will be uh, not supporting Margaret's amendment. 
<coughs> yes, my experience with uh, mainly women's groups, uh, in particular rape crisis, would suggest to me that uh, uh, juries, some people in juries, have preconceived ideas about how somebody would present and how they would handle themselves. You know, would 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 they be calm? Uh, they expect them not to be calm. So there is a prejudice there in the first place, and I think it's I think it's good for the courts and good for the system that simple explanations uh, are made. I, I don't think that, that uh, um, judges should try in any way influence people's mind on the case. But if, if uh, and there is evidence uh, available that suggests that quite a substantial number in a jury, there is expectations uh, about when people report, if they, take, if they delay in reporting, then uh, in that case they say it didn't take place when in fact that's not, not the case because there's some complex reasons why people don't present and it could be a family reason. And, and quite, often, quite often people are raped by those that they know and that might have a consequence in itself because it might be a friend of the husband or the wife that was participating in that. And the consequences for the whole family, including the husband and the wife and the children, as a consideration and rather than maybe doing the right thing and being brave and it is a brave person that presents in the Scottish court with regards to rape it's a horrendous experience for them and they, they need to relive so that's a consequence in itself where someone has been raped and they may reflect for a good number of years actually before and it might be if I could intervene uh, uh, say this it might well be the case a second it takes a place and they hear that the person that raped them uh, in, in a case. And it might be that that causes them to have the courage to put themselves through the mill and report something that happened. So for all these reasons, it is a very complex area, but I, I see it's good, uh, it's, it's good law that explanation and education is given if we know that people have preconceived ideas, which is a prejudice. Thank you. Nobody else is there to get uh, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, amendment 1 and 2 would remove the provision contained in the bill relating to the introduction of statutory jury uh, directions. Uh, this issue has been extensively debated during the Stage 1 uh, process and I'm pleased that a majority of the committee supported jury directions during uh, the Stage 1 uh, uh, report. Uh, members uh, do not need to be reminded that we have included these provisions in the bill to deal with an important underlying issue. Uh, namely, as uh, Elaine Murray highlighted, some members of the public, and thus some members of a jury, will hold preconceived and ill-founded attitudes as to how sexual offences are committed and how someone uh, subject to a sexual offence will likely react when an offence is taking place and afterwards. Some people think that anyone carrying out a sexual offence will almost always require to use physical force. In addition, some people think someone will always offer physical resistance when an offence is being committed, and that someone will always uh, make an immediate report to the police after an offence has been committed. When jurors hold these views, and where uh, any of these scenarios has, uh, has taken place, it is, uh, is, it is unfortunate that they can allow uh, these unenlightened views to affect how they consider the evidence in a case. There is clear research that shows that people react in many different ways when a sexual offence is taking place and in the aftermath of an offence taking place. There is no one standard type of reaction uh, that should be expected and this body of research shows that it is perfectly normal for a person not to offer physical resistance to a sexual offence being committed or not report the offence for a period of time. We are clear that jurors must consider the evidence they have heard in the case. So the intent behind jury directions is simple. We want the focus of the jury to be on the evidence laid before them. Any preconceived and ill-founded attitudes that may be held should not play a part in the decision of the jury. Members are aware that there is discretion built into the provisions for the judge as to whether a jury direction is needed. If no issues are, say, raised 
at the trial uh, relating to a delay in the reporting of a sexual offence, the jury direction is not required. Even where an issue relating to delay may have been heard in evidence, the judge does not have to give the direction if they consider no reasonable jury would think the issue of delay was material to whether the offence had, had been committed. The judge uh, has a similar discretion in relation to jury directions on lack of physical force or physical restraint. We consider the jury directions provision contained in the bill are the right approach, with jury, judicial discretion and flexibility built into them, and therefore the Scottish Government does not support Amendment 1 and 2 in the name of Margaret Mitchell. Thank you, Councillor. You could imagine I'm itching to sum up, but it's not for me to sum up. I'll save that for stage three, if we get this at stage three, uh, because of lots of material there to attack, in my view. Margaret, you get the opportunity. Thank you, convener. And this is not, as Roddy Campbell seems to suggest, the legal establishment um, opposing progress. The concerns expressed by the so-called legal establ establishment have been expressed because this amendment interferes with two important principles in our democracy in Scotland. The first is the separation of powers, and that's a fundamental constitutional principle. And the second is the independence of the judiciary, a central tenet of Scots law, and one which, if this amendment starts to interfere with, a precedent is set in one area of the law, then it's fair game to argue that the same precedent and the same jury direction should apply to other areas of the law. In effect, once the genie is out of the bottle, it is impossible to put it back. It's been argued by the Cabinet Secretary somewhat disingenuously that this is the only way to tackle the misconceptions about the, from juries about the evidence led in sexual offence cases. No one, I think, is arguing here that these don't and haven't existed and don't affect conviction rates. The important point is there is another very effective way to address this, and that was confirmed by the Crown and Procurator Fiscal, by Lord Carloway, who all said the only barrier to using this effective rem remedy is cost. But here's the point. Cost considerations should not take precedent over interfering with the independence of the judiciary or fundamental constitutional principles. And for these reasons, I press the amendment in my name. Very much. The question is Amendment 1. We agree to. Are we all agreed? No. Yes. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. There are no abstentions. So it's two in favour and eight against. That amendment is not agreed to. Or seven. I beg your pardon. I'm adding, adding people to the committee. So we go on. So why make it worse than it is? It was only seven against, not eight. Now, I go on to... Next one, which is Amendment 3, in the name of Margaret Mitchell and the group in its own. Margaret, please, to move and speak to Amendment 3. Can I say to the committee, I'm intending, and to the Cabinet Secretary, I think it's useful to know, I'm going to go to uh, Amendment 18 and finish, conclude at Section 9 today. I think that's a fair whack it. It will not get through all today. Okay, okay. Margaret. Thank you, Convena. This Amendment 3 provides that where an application is made to recover psychiatric psychological or medical records of the complainer in sexual offences cases listed under section 20, uh, 288C of the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act 1995. The complainer must be notified of a right to seek legal advice and to appoint a legal representative and must also be given the opportunity to seek such advice and appoint such a representative. Where the complainer appoints a legal representative, that representative must be given the opportunity to submit written evidence and represent the complainer at any hearing in relation to the application. The fees incurred by the legal representative would be borne by the Slot Scottish Legal Aid Fund under regulations made by Scottish ministers. 
As members will know, this is the third bill in which I sought to address the issue of medical records, including psychiatric records, being released in sexual offence cases where the complainer had, had they the opportunity, would object to these releases. However, this is... There is, what is notably different on this occasion is that this amendment follows the recent decision in the judicial review petition of WFRC's the Scottish Ministers and Intervenors Rape Crisis Scotland from February this year, which found that in denying a complainer, in this case a domestic abuse victim, the right to oppose the release of her medical records was a breach of her Article 8 right to privacy under the European Convention of Human Rights. The Scottish uh, ministers defending their position refused to make legal aid available, arguing that the victim had no right to be heard or represented in front of the sheriff on that application. Lord Glennie, on hearing the petition, held that the Scottish minister's decision to refuse legal aid was based on an error of law and contrary to the duty imposed on them in terms of the Victims and Witnesses Scotland Act 2014 which states in section 1 that a victim or witness should be able to participate effectively in the investigation and proceedings. He went on to say the complainer is entitled to have her ECHR rights protected effectively. Furthermore, I have taken on in the drafting, comments raised by the Cabinet Secretary at Stage 3 of the Criminal Justice Scotland Bill, and this amendment applies not only to applications in the Sheriff Court, but it also includes similar applications in the High Court for orders granting commission and diligence for recovery of documents and orders for the production of documents. The use of these medical records is often used to discredit a victim's testimony. It it, it, it is, or it should therefore, be for the court to determine whether there is a merit in having the documents released. However, the point is that without the complainer there to object, only one side of the argument is held. There is, therefore, I believe, no reason why this amendment should not be passed as it merely seeks to ensure the findings of the judicial review decision are included in statute, and I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. Lane, followed by Alison, please. Thank you. I think I have to uh, congratulate Margaret Mitchell on her tenacity in bringing this issue forward because she has brought it to. She says three. I, th I thought it was even more bills than that. And I don't know whether she's actually just managed to sort of wear me down. But <laughs> but You're doing so well before that. <laughs> uh, I think some of the issues that um, I had concerns with previously seem to be addressed here. However, also, I think this is probably the right place, the right bill for this provision to be included in it. It seems to be an appropriate bill. In the past, I had some concerns about how what appeared to having three different lawyers in court representing different people, and also that at one point it seemed to be the, the case that you would get, uh, that all complainers would get legal aid, whereas I notice now that the Scottish ministers would make provision for fees, so therefore, obviously, the, the, uh, there could be some sort of scale, as there would be with uh, uh, accused in terms of their uh, ability to get legal aid. So I have considerable sympathy for this amendment now, uh, particularly in light of the case to which Margaret Mitchell referred uh, and the fact that somebody's human rights may not have been being respected because they had been un unable to get these provisions. So I'm actually inclined to, to uh, uh, support it on this occasion. Alison, followed by Roderick. Thank you. <coughs> As Elaine said, Margaret's tenacity in this is, is, is well known and I have supported it in the past. And I think we've been vindicated by the recent judicial review on this, that um, clearly the government has been wrong in law um, in its interpretation of, of the situation in relation to these petitions for recoveries of documents. It's quite clear that in those circumstances, the Crown represents the public interest and not the victim's right. At that point, the Crown represents the victim's right as one of a number of competing interests, uh, the right to a fair trial and the other victims, etc., and indeed public policy. So there's no doubt that there's an anomaly here that needs to be addressed. It doesn't need legislation to address it. 
um, the Cabinet Secretary could amend legal aid regulations uh, to do so, and I would urge him to tell us today that he is looking at that, because I do think um, that, that there has been a misunderstanding in law, um, and we need to move forward on this. It's actually a really important issue. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, Margaret Mitchell has referred to the decision of Lord Gurney in uh, the court session in W. WV, sorry, which is WF, sorry, which is an ongoing case. I have to be careful what, what I say about that in that respect. But there are obviously two two important points from that case. One is he clearly found that procedurally, in the light of Article 8, um, the, um, the, the, the lady concerned should have been given notice of the application for the witness summons. And then having established that, he then went on to consider the issue of legal aid. And as Margaret has suggested, he says that... Uh, Convention jur jurisprudence indicates that the complainer is entitled to have her uh, rights protected effectively. The key question is, how can they be protected effectively unless she's able to have appropriate yeah. representation? So there are issues that are raised. Uh, there are issues that are raised which would might obviously cause a, a substantial increase in kind of uh, the cost to the legal aid yeah. fund. But there are issues which I hope the Cabinet Secretary can help us on now. Uh, John. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I, I concur with a lot of what Elaine Murray said, and indeed, um, you know, uh, second time today, it's somewhere where I will have changed my position. I think that's a, a very interesting uh, ruling, and you know, it's grateful that members are, are highlighting it. I think it brings us into the same realm where we're in with fatal accident inquiries, and where the public interest and the individual's interest can sometimes conflict. I don't share Rod's view that uh, there will be substantial costs uh, associated with. There's certainly um, the potential for substantial uh, injury to individuals if, they're, if the abuse that can associate itself with this mere request for this information um, isn't allowed to, is allowed to go unchallenged. So um, I will be supporting Margaret. Uh, thank you, Convener. Members will recall, um, as uh, Margaret Mitchell has alluded to, that some amendments have been proposed in the past, and I, I want to start now, as I have I started then uh, by sympathising very strongly with the intention behind uh, these amendments. Uh, the day after uh, this amendment was lodged, the court issued its judgment in uh, judicial review by WF. The case dealt with representation uh, from a complainer. Because the slight alarm bells running that this may be sub judice. You're we're quite I'm coming on to that. Thank I'm coming you very on much. to that. Thank you. Uh, this case uh, dealt with representation uh, for a complainer seeking to restrict access to her medical records in connection with a criminal case. I must remind the committee that the criminal proceedings concerned have not been concluded. Uh, the Scottish Government is not appealing this decision. It's an important judgment and clarifies a number of issues that will lead to significant changes in procedure in cases where an application is made to recover sensitive information. The principles confirmed by this judgment apply in all applications of sensitive information, not just in cases of sexual offences. Lord Glenny applies his decision to any person whose Article 8 rights may be infringed by an order for recovery of medical records or other sensitive documents. The Article 8 right is to privacy. The rights he finds extend, therefore, not only to psychiatric, psychological or medical records, but to other sensitive information and also to persons other than a complainer. I have informed agents acting for WF of my determination granting their application for legal aid. I recognise that it, it was important to deal with this matter first to allow the associated criminal trial to proceed without further disruption. Changes to the legal aid system require to be made in respect of the case, uh, cases of this nature and plans are being developed to deliver the necessary changes. Meantime, I have put in place interim arrangements that will allow the Scottish Legal Aid Board to provide legal aid in future similar cases. Importantly, a means test will not be applied in this interim arrangement. Legal aid in the form of assistance by way of representation 
will be available in appropriate circumstances for individuals whose sensitive records are being sought. Lord Glenny has confirmed that a right to intimation and a right to be heard together with, where appropriate, a right to representation already exists. This means that there is no need for Margaret Mitchell's amendment. And as the amendment is set out in terms of sexual offences, it would introduce unnecessary confusion. What is relevant is the sensitivity of the records in issue, not the particular categorisation of the offence. I note that Amendment 8 does not provide for intimation of the application directly to the person whose records are being sought. The judgment has confirmed that a complainer or witness ought to have intimation of the application whether or not they decide to appoint a legal rep representative. The judgment also confirms that the courts have the power now to protect these rights. For the future, Lord, rec Lord Glenny's recommendation recommends that rules of court are made to cover such applications. There is good reason for this. Rules are inherently more flexible. Uh, they are thus uh, a more appropriate uh, mechanism for dealing with the arrangements for asserting these rights. It is the approach, this is the approach taken, as Lord Glenny points out, in civil cases in Scotland and in England and Wales. The challenge for those who are members of the Criminal Rules Committee in developing the rules includes the preservation of the fundamental principle that complainers have no right to appear in criminal trials. Indeed, uh, Lord Glenny uh, himself outlined several ways in which the rules he considers uh, desirable could operate, and not all of these involve an appearance of the complainer in every relevant hearing. There is an additional challenge in that, at present, we do not have data showing what the potential demand may be. In these circumstances, we think the inherent flexibility of rules of court compared to primary legislation is what is now required. The Government has always made clear that we would wish to invest in support for victims. Members will be aware that I have previously outlined a monitoring exercise uh, we are presently undertaking uh, for applications to lead character or history evidence. This is currently underway. The information this and any necessary follow-up uh, provide together with developing experience uh, will, from developing experience, will inform the development of rules, uh, the rules that Lord Glenny is seeking. In summary, then, the aims of this amendment lodged by Margaret Mitchell are already achieved and do not need to be legislated for. It is the case that the position today is that a court will require to ensure the rights of, the, of complainers and others whose sensitive records are sought will be protected through a right to be intimated that sensitive records are being sought and a right to be heard will be given as consideration is given to whether the sensitive records will be disclosed. Scottish Ministers have directed the Scottish Legal Aid Board to provide legal aid in the form of assistance by way of representation to afford effective representation to those who seek to protect their sensitive information. And we will work to ensure a permanent solution is put in place that will meet the requirements of Lord Glenny's judgment. And I would therefore ask members, uh, I would ask Margaret Mitchell to withdraw her amendment. Margaret, please. I'm greatly encouraged by the, the comments from the Cabinet Secretary. Um, uh, he's said quite a lot there, uh, which I think needs to be looked at in some detail to ensure that this group of people who I have argued for uh, consistently over many years now are not going to be disadvantaged, that there isn't going to be a time lapse that um, disadvantages them if this amendment was passed as opposed to what the, um, the government's suggesting. It doesn't seem to be the case, but um, I'm happy to withdraw this stage and hopefully work with the Cabinet Secretary to ensure that we have the kind of provision which rape crisis um, is in favour of and which we know has um, been such a barrier to um, getting a fair trial 
and uh, invoking Article 8 uh, for complain uh, people whose medical, psychological and um, uh, psychiatric records have been sought, not for any justifiable reason, but merely to discredit them in court. So with that, I seek um, permission to withdraw. Well, I think you've done very well, Margaret. I think you're very, not allowed to clap, but I know how you feel. It's a pity, but it's one of the little, well, I don't know, I could have let you clap, you know, why not? But it's very unusual, but we're quite an unusual committee at times. We've been sitting a very long time today. Uh, Margaret sees leave to withdraw, is that agreed? Thank you very much. Uh, I call Amendment 8 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Group of Amendments 9, 10 and 18. Cabinet Secretary, please to move Amendment 8 and speak to the other amendments. Uh, amendment 8 to 10 and 18 address uh, the points raised by Professor James Chalmers in his evidence to the committee during stage 1 about sections 7 and 8 of the bill concerning the extension of extra ju territorial jurisdiction of Scottish courts to sexual offences against children committed in the other jurisdictions of the United Kingdom. Uh, the concern was that the bill as introduced defined habitual residents of Scotland uh, to include persons who had become habitually resident after committing the, offence, the criminal act, which are the focus of these provisions. As a result, uh, dual criminality requirements for non-habitual residents of Scotland would not apply in relation to persons who become habitually resident of Scotland at some point after the criminal act. Uh, Professor Chalmers argued that the provisions as drafted had retrospective effect uh, because simply by moving to Scotland, a person could become criminally liable for an act which was not a crime in the place where they did it at the time when they did it. As I said in my evidence to the committee, uh, this is a largely theoretical concern as the law concerning sexual offences against children in the different jurisdictions of the United Kingdom is very similar and it's hard to envisage acts which are criminal in Scotland that would be lawful in England, Wales or Northern Ireland or vice versa. However, we consider it is appropriate to remedy the issue through our amendment. Amendment 8 and 10 adjust the definition of habitual residence, resident of Scotland, uh, which are to be inserted in section 54 and 54A of the Sexual Offences Scotland Act 2009, so that they include only persons who were habitually resident in Scotland at the time that they, uh, uh, that they committed and constituted the uh, list offence under Scots law. As such, a person can be held criminally liable for an act that was an offence under Scots law, but not under the law of the jurisdiction within the UK where the act took place, or where it was intended to take place, only if they were habitually resident in Scotland at the time they did so. Professor Chalmers uh, also noted that the uh, existing provisions concerning extraterritorial jurisdiction at section 54 and 55 of the Sexual Offences Scotland Act 2009 has the same problem. So that amendments 9 and 18 address this. It's worth noting that a slightly different approach has been taken with amendment 18 in that a person who was not a UK national or resident at the time that they committed the offence in a country outside the UK may be liable to be prosecuted for that offence if they subsequently take up UK residency or become a UK national, if the act in question also constituted an offence under the law in force in the country where the act took place at the time that it took place. We have provided for the amendment in this way to ensure that a person cannot take up UK residency or become a UK citizen and by doing so evade prosecution for a sexual offence against a child in another country. And I move Amendment 8. Much. Rod? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I very much welcome uh, the Cabinet Secretary's comments. Uh, th these points were made by uh, an academic, and I think, f for the record, the points in relation to Sections 54 and 55 of the Sexual Offences 2009 were highlighted by Gerard May Mayer of the University of, of uh, Edinburgh rather than Professor Chalmers. So we had two academics making points, and that really helped us with uh, our evidence session on the 17th of November. So I'm really pleased that the, the Cabinet Secretary has taken note of it. Uh, 
you don't wish to wind up, Cabinet Secretary. Questions, Amendment 8, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment yeah. 9, name Cabinet Secretary, ready to debate with Amendment 8, Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. Questions, Amendment 9, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Questions at Section 7, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Call Amendment 10 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, ready to debate with Amendment 8, Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. Questions, Amendment 10, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. Call Amendment 11 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary Group with Amendments 12 to 17. Cabinet Secretary, please to move Amendment 11 and speak to the other amendments in the group. Okay, amendment 11 and 17 are intended to enable a prosecution to be brought in Scotland for a listed sexual offence against a child in a case where it is known that the act took place in the UK, but the jurisdiction in which it took place is not known. Uh, committee members will be aware of a case highlighted to you during the Stage 1 evidence session in which it was alleged that a child was abused in a van travelling on the M74 between Carlisle and Dumfries and the abuser could not be prosecuted because it was not possible to have established whether the offence had been committed in England or in Scotland. Uh, while such cases will be very rare, uh, discussions with uh, Crown Office indicate there has been at least one other case of this kind. We consider that it is also possible uh, that a historic uh, child sexual abuse case could arise where the victim lived as a child both in Scotland and in other parts of the UK, possibly even several other parts of the UK, and may not be able to say with certainty whether the abuse occurred in Scotland or another part of the UK. So Amendment 11 and 17 uh, provide that uh, an indictment or complaint in which a listed offence is charged it does not need to does not need to cert does not need certain information from which country in the United Kingdom in which the act took place uh, can be determined. Uh, but if uh, the indictment does not identify the country where the act took place, uh, certain extra limitations apply to prosecution of the offence in Scotland. These are firstly that prosecution is not competent if the person charged with the offence has been or is being prosecuted for the act constituting the offence elsewhere in the UK, and secondly, that the head of public prosecutions in any jurisdiction in which the offence may have been committed must be consulted before the prosecution is uh, initiated. Uh, provision is also made for the unlikely situation in which, as part of a course of conduct also involving offences alleged to have been committed by the accused person in Scotland, the prosecution uh, wished to liable a listed offence uh, which may have been committed in England and Wales or Northern Ireland, uh, but which is not alleged was committed in Scotland. In these circumstances, uh, both heads of uh, public prosecutions must be consulted and the person must also be charged with a listed offence alleged to have been committed in Scotland. Amendment 12 and 13 are minor amendments concerning the requirement that must be satisfied before a prosecution can be brought in respect of a listed offence. When taken together, the effects of Amendment 12 and 13 is to remove the condition that an act be a criminal offence in the UK jurisdiction where it took place to trigger the need to satisfy the requirements, including the Crown Office obligation to consult with the prosecution service in the other jurisdictions ahead of a Scottish prosecution. There is a higher degree of uniformity across UK uh, there is a high degree of uniformity across the UK's jurisdictions in relation to sexual offences against children, and we think it appropriate simply to require prosecutors in Scotland to consult with their counterparts in other parts of the UK whenever they are contemplating prosecuting an act which has occurred in other UK jurisdictions. Uh, Amendment 14 deals with circumstances where the prosecutor always al allows a complaint or indictment to fall and serves a new complaint in respect of the same conduct. It provides that the consultation uh, with the local prosecutor must take place before the particular prosecution that is being uh, taken forward. Amendment 15 ensures that the existing provisions in the Bill intended to preve prevent people being prosecuted more than once in the UK in relation to the same Act does not prevent a prosecution in Scotland where a prosecution in another jurisdiction is withdrawn 
specifically to allow the Scottish prosecution to go ahead. Amendment 16 is intended to provide greater clarity as to when a prosecution can be said to have been initiated. And I move Amendment 11. Thank you very much. No members indicated they wish to speak. Cabinet Secretary, you don't want to wind up. Question is that Amendment 11 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call amendments 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated. And I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move on block. Moved. Uh, does any member object to a single question? Put amendments 12 to 17. No members objected. Nope. You'll need to be quick. Nope. The question is that amendments 12 to 17 are agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. And last run we're at. The question is that section 8 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call amendment 18. In the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with amendment 8. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is that amendment 18 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that section 9 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Well, that concludes consideration of stage 2 for today. We've just a little bit to do. Next week, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary and officials for attending? and for the fortitude of the committee, but we're not finished. So I'll suspend just for a minute to allow witnesses to leave, and we move on to the next item. And we move on to item three, public petitions. And this is for continuation petition PE 1370, McGrahy conviction. Last week we agreed to consider this following late receipt of Lord Advocate's latest response to the petition. Members will now have had a chance to consider this response along with further material provided by the petitioners. Additional background information relating to our previous consideration was also provided with your papers as requested together with extra papers, I know you like lots of papers, which came in late yesterday from Lord Advocate's office, so much of it attached, I believe, was previously within your ken. Can I have your views on what you'd like to do with this petition? <coughs> I'm looking around. Leave it open, is that all? Is there anything else you want to say about it? Because I would like to say something if nobody else will. It's simply that, um, do we want more information <coughs> on Operation Sandwood, time scale for it. I think it would be appropriate to ask that. John? Lost to know if I were not in receipt of specific responses to the questions that have been asked and um, legitimately posed. And, indeed, some of the information, you know, for instance, um, the Crown agent asked a senior prosecutor who had no private involvement in the Lockerbie investigation and associate prosecution to act as a conduit for senior investigating officer to ensure that access to any material that the Crown has and the Police Service of Scotland consider it necessary for full and thorough consideration of allegations. Is that one and the same person as we're talking about in these papers? It would be very helpful to know the identity of, of the individuals involved, um, if, if not specifically who they are, who appointed them, Basically, everything comes back to these questions legitimately asked, and I cannot see why, rather than have papers delivered to this committee at the 11th hour, and appreciating the, the, the swift turnaround that was required from last week, we just can't get simple responses to the very unambiguous questions that have been posed. Your questions are therefore? Questions therefore are those as contained in the annex to our paper three. Page? Pages four and five. The bullet-pointed questions. Right. Who appoint? That's um, and this is a private paper, is it? No. 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 So this is in public, so I don't need to go through them. No. Um, so you want question? Are you agreeable to that? Well, we've we've uh, known about these questions for a little while. On the fifth of January. We didn't raise that issue. That's well, I'm asking if you're raising it now. I'm trying to get consensus. I've been moving um, to uh, 
take no further action uh, before dissolution uh, without closing it, leave it for a future committee to decide on further action. I, I would, well, can I pitch in here that I would quite like to know who the independent council is that's been uh, appointed. I mean, we never found out that. Yes, Roddy. I wanted to add what we, what, uh, what we said at the last meeting, but it's about process and it shouldn't be about individuals. So mm -hmm. I'm quite happy to, to uh, leave it open, but uh, not doing any further action. Well, what an astonishing position for um, elected politicians to find themselves in, that a member of the public, one of your constituents, could pose questions, legitimate questions about process, and what you've said is, we'll pass it on until the, the uh, end of May. That's not a tenable position no, 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 at all. No, 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 no. Be, be, well, before no, uh, to the gentleman, to the chair, yeah. yes. Be, be, before getting at that, Governor, can I make it, can I repeat exactly what I said? It should be about process, mm -hmm. and we agreed about that. Well, this and is process. And not about individuals. No. We made it very clear at the last meeting is what we said we would do. So I, I, would, I would repeat it. It should be about process and not individuals. Therefore, we should leave it open and leave it at that. Do you want to know what time scale there is for the, the investigation um, on um, the progress of Operation Sandwood? I'm, I'm happy that you rephrased your, 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 your question, but I, I will leave it at that, as, as I said. I, do you wish to do that? I'm asking. No, the committee. I'm happy to leave it at that. You, you're happy with that, that we find the progress of... No, I'm you just happy, leave it I'm open. happy to, not to leave it to open. Do that. And not to do that. Don't agree with you, actually, but then could I have some other voices? I think there are one or two things that it's in fairness to ask, which is, you know, what's the progress of Operation Sandwich? It's fair enough. Mm -hmm. Um, who's been appointed as independent crown council? I've never found that out. It's not. It's not. It can't be a secret. And then, and then we'll continue the petition. I think that's fair enough. These are markers. You don't agree. I made my point very, very clear. Made your point. Uh, Anybody and, and else want to say anything, please? Uh, Elaine. I mean, given that the committee will only sit for another two sessions after this, I'm not really so how, sure how much more that this committee can achieve as opposed to the next committee of the, of the Parliament. So, you know, even if we did ask these questions, what are we going to do with them? Once we've well, they're there. It? The answers will be there for the next committee. That's all I'm saying. The answers would be there. Maybe. Ellie Allison. Maybe. Maybe. The solution is neither here nor there. I think we pursue something with the same vigour that we would pursue it if we had a year to go. Um, and in effect, at the end of the day, we bump up against the buffers, then that's what happens. But I think it's, a, it, it's incumbent on us to, to continue to pursue the issues that have exercised us for so long. Which are? Which is what do you want to pursue? Yes, which are the, 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 the points that John and yourself have made about this. These are the bullet points yes. here, pursuing those. You want to do that now. I have to get some kind of agreement from the committee about this. Um, well, it's, it's quite difficult to reach the consensus view. Okay. If, uh, if it's kind of what's happening to Operation Sandwood and who's the Independent Crown Council, in the spirit of compromise, those two points, but I'm not sure that we want to say, we want to go through the whole bullet points that have been on the table. I'm looking at you to see. Yeah, well, well, I'm a bit exasperated. We've spent two hours going into the minutia of, of legislation, quite rightly so, very detailed ideas, concepts, and, and the relationships um, with us and other legislation. And here, here is a simple process, and I absolutely agree with my colleagues, it is about process, it's not about individuals. I, I've spent a lot of time trying to understand the process, I don't mm -hmm. understand the process. I just thought colleagues in the Justice Committee would want to understand the process. I'm suggesting that rather than reinvent invent the wheel, a very simple way to do it would be to secure very simple answers to the very simple eight questions that have been posed about the whole process. And, and I really am at a loss to know what the what the issue is about that. Is there any, you've compromised a little in that, uh, you know, you're, we want to know who the independent council is. I think it's a relevant question to ask who appointed the independent council. This is a huge problem, isn't it, for the Crown, to some extent, investigating the Crown. Um, and that is a process matter, uh, uh, Christian. It's not anything. It's just it's, it's a very unusual circumstance to be in in this particular issue. Do we want to ask who appointed independent council? Just ask, and who is that independent council? I think that's a fair enough thing. There shouldn't be anything to hide there. Can we ask some of them? I'm trying to get somewhere, John, for everybody. Well, I don't think the identity of the individuals necessarily perfect, to be honest, um, convener. Don't need to know the identity. 
we need to understand the process that so has been who, followed. So, who process. appointed independent counsel? Can you can you settle for that? No, I'm, I've been very clear. It's I know you have. I'm asking you to try and get consensus around the tables. I want something the committee to come to. I'm not asking them to agree absolutely everything, but you know, if we all stick in black and white, we're not going to move forward. And I don't know what we can do then. Each time we agree about process. There is a question coming in to identify somebody. No, I've, I've, missed, I've left and, that. And I, 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 I've parked that. Never from me. No, bear with me, Christian. I've parked that. I've said all we want to know is, all right, what was the process for appointing independent counsel? Shall we rephrase it? I don't know what other members think about that, but uh, as far as there is no individual, you know, we, we, there is a place for the Justice Committee, there is a place for the campaign, Justice for, for Maghari campaign. You know, if I wanted to be on the Justice Maghari campaign, I would be on the Justice Maghari campaign. This is the Justice Committee. It's not to do with that. I mean, we went through this last week, Christian. It's to do with, let's imagine it was some other um, partition that had come to us, we're in a process of a very strange situation where somebody is to be appointed to look at the actings of the Crown Office. And that's, I've never been there before and I don't know how you do it. And it's a process that, is the Crown Office never to be investigated by anybody? You know, who holds the Crown Office to account? I think that's the kind of questions we're asking. I'm looking for you, John. Is that not what you're looking for? Well, entirely, and, and if, uh, I mean, I absolutely sense my colleagues' question, discomfort, yeah. and if, if, if it helps them rip the name off the top of the paper and say, if this is Joe Bloggs, yeah. um, how do we answer? Um, how do we answer the, 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 the process? I mean, many times we've asked, for particular, you know, when some cases are not pursued, how does the Crown Office, you know, what do they, why do they not pursue certain cases? We've raised that before, um, but this time we're looking at the Crown itself, Margaret. Yes, an issue about the Crown Office. I've raised, um, I've written an article on it. Who watches and who um, decides Crown Office? It's not a new issue, um, convener. But we've been with this profession for many years, way back. I, I, I would probably have closed to at an earlier stage. I haven't deviated from my opinion of what I've stated today. I think now is the time to, without closing it, leave yeah. it for a first. Can, can I just say then, because decide. I can't get consensus, I'm not going to get it. Can we perhaps just agree that we get the, find out the progress of Operation uh, Sandwood and then we, we continue open? That's all I can get today. It's up to individual members to pursue other issues themselves if they wish at the time being. I have to get a consensus from committee. Would you agree to that? I'm Right, so would you agree to that, Margaret? The interest that, consensus. You're always, you're always good at that, Margaret. Besides, you got a round of applause today. Never let that forget. You've superseded Margaret's one-liner that absolutely took the feet from under, God, the feet from under the Chief Constable. So if we can at yeah, least Margaret. do that. John, it may not be all you want, oh, but let's, let's just do yes, that. Yes, absolutely. Okay, I'm going to do that. We keep the petition open. Thank you very much. I now move on to item four on the agenda. It's consideration of three negative instruments. I'll try to fly through these. The Police Service of Scotland Senior Officers Performance Regulation. It creates a process for managing the performance of senior police officers where their performance is found to be unsatisfactory. The DPLR committee agreed to draw this instrument to the attentions as it contained, well, surprise, surprise, some drafting errors. The Scottish Government has undertaken to lay an amending instrument to correct these errors as soon as is reasonably practical. Do you have any comments in relation to that particular instrument. Are members content to make no recommendations? Yeah. I beg your pardon, John. No, I, I just think, that, um, you know, I would strongly welcome this legislation. I think it could be very timely. Right, you've got that on the record and we're not making any recommendations. The second negative instrument under consideration is the Civic Government Scotland Act 1982 Metal Dealers and Itinerant Metal Dealers Verification of Name and Address Regulations 2016. It stipulates particular means that can be used by a metal dealer, itinerant metal dealer, for the purpose of verifying a person's name and address in relation to any metal acquired or disposed of by sale or exchange. Another important little, you know, these are very important, these um, little instruments. The DPLR committee did not draw the instrument to the attention of the Parliament on any grounds within its remit. Do you have any comments? Thank you very much. We agree. No, 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 more, no yes. more thieving of and metal. This, and this will put the ten Let's high. protect network rail. <laughs> what did you say, Mr. Patterson? And this will put, put the, the tin high. Oh, dearie me. 
I, mem- I hope that wasn't written before you came in here. Our members can tend to be no recommendation in relation to this instrument. Yeah. Now, before we descend into real frivolity, the third and final negative instrument under consideration is the Restriction of Liberty Order Scotland Amendment Regulations. It specifies that certain devices may be used for the purposes of remotely monitoring a prison's, prisoner's compliance with the conditions specified by virtue of section 40, two, 40 brackets, two brackets of the Criminal Justice Scotland Act 2003. Again, the DPLR committee did not draw the instrument to the attention of the Parliament on any grounds within its remit. Do you have any comments in relation to this instrument? Well, thank you very much. The members content to make no recommendations. That concludes our consideration of the legislation today. The next meeting will take place. You needn't move yet. Class is not dismissed. Uh, Don't pack your satchels. Uh, 8th of March, when we'll continue to take evidence in relation to the Family Law Scotland Act 2006, consider subordinate legislation, look at a draft of the committee's legacy report, and we will conclude our amendments on the Abusive Behaviour and Sexual Harm Scotland Bill. And I now close the meeting.